Hi, welcome everyone um, to the 2016 Fair Housing and Lending Seminar. Uh, I, I would like to thank you for coming and I'd also like to thank our speakers and our sponsors. And we're going to start right now with a welcome from the city manager. Thank you, Rose. So I'd like to officially welcome you in addition to Rose's welcome. You're going to feel very welcomed here in a minute. That's right. <laughs> Uh, no, it's great to have you all. You know, housing is uh, something that's uh, just core and just critical to the community. It's near and dear to my heart as well. Uh, I started my career a little bit farther north of here and uh, never thought about housing, right? It was just something that was part of life. And uh, th through happenstance, as in all of our careers, I think, uh, I fell into it and learned a lot about it. And I didn't realize just how complicated it is, right? HUD has a lot of rules. They don't often seem to make sense, although there are reasons they're there. Some of them are great rules. I remember uh, one example. Uh, when I got started, it was still legal in Iowa to deny someone housing because they had Section 8. So imagine that scenario. You, you go, you're, you're going to rent an apartment. And they ask you, okay, how are you going to pay? And you say, well, I've got Section 8. And then, I'm, and then they say no. Oh, I'm not taking Section 8. Can you imagine that? Refuse money. <laughs> you're there. You're ready to sign and say no. Uh, that's changed. Part of those new rules that happen because of those situations. It's now illegal to do that in Iowa. So uh, we all complain about regulations, but they're there for reasons. Some of them are, are really good. Uh, so. I uh, came at it sideways and grew to love housing and realize how important it is for the community and uh, you know just how our history is so filled with you know uh, issues on both sides just the politics of housing gets pretty rough uh, and interestingly it doesn't matter what party's in control it seems to always get cut <laughs> you know it's like they funded it in the 60s and they've been shaving away funding ever since uh, both parties, which uh, you wouldn't have expected until you look at the data. So it's, uh, it's incumbent on all of us to continue to do the good work, you know, fight the good fight and uh, stay up on what the latest uh, techniques are to survive that reality. Uh, you know, I know this year we survived a, 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 an effort to completely defund the home program almost. I mean, that was huge. We were able to, uh, you know, rally support and avoid that outcome at the federal level. Uh, so I think I probably beat the drum enough. You don't, you already know how important housing is. That's why you're here, right? So I want to just thank you for your caring about it and for coming out to stay current and to help all of us stay current, share, share your expertise. I do want to recognize some specific individuals and thank them for speaking. So, Rigel Oliveri is here, and Eric Creekle. Where's Eric? Oh, right there you are. Yeah, I saw you right there too. I didn't uh, didn't remember. Kelly Capitosto. That's right, virtually. Uh, and Randy Cole. There's Randy. So thank you all for coming. These folks, you know, volunteered their time to do this, right? We don't have speaker, uh, we don't write checks for folks because we can't afford that, right? It's housing. Uh, so thank, thank all of you for doing that. Uh, and I want to thank the sponsors of the event. You know, the Missouri Commission on Human Rights. Do we have anyone representing them this early? There you go. There you are again. <laughs> uh, so thank you for, for that. Uh, Columbia Housing Authority. There you are. Thank you. You know, you're the, you're the biggest player in this space in Columbia, and we, we love that you're there. All right. You can get on the list, right? That's right. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, the Columbia Apartment Association. Is anybody representing them? This early. There you are. Thank you guys, you know. Uh, and thank you for taking Section 8, right? <laughs> yes, uh, and then, of course, the City of Columbia Human Rights Commission, which I know Rose uh, helps out. Is there someone from the commission here this morning? Well, thank them uh, for their work. They do tremendous work on education, and, uh, and they're 
effort at human rights is, is laudable. And of course we have the city staff who, who does a great job. Randy and his shop, thank you guys for being involved and coming. So with that, uh, additional welcome and thank you. I'd like to introduce our Ward 2 Council Member Michael Trapp, who's going to present a proclamation, which is uh, another way to say welcome. <laughs> thank you. So let me uh, be the third one to say welcome. <laughs> Glad that, uh, that you're here. I've been engaged with housing um, for a long time. In my day job, I'm the executive director at Phoenix Health Programs. And we our mission is to improve the health and quality of life of those impacted by drugs and alcohol, but we're, which means that we're about one-third housing because people, about 25% of people who come into treatment don't have a place to go when they leave. And um, so we're also a player in the affordable housing. We have about 100 scattered site units and a 12-bed homeless veterans uh, shelter. So that has, and as I became a policymaker, I've been highly engaged in regards to issues around affordable housing. And I'm glad that you're all out today. Um, for a fair housing event to learn more about um, to ensure that we treat everyone equitably and that we address the real housing challenges that uh, confront us as people's ability to pay for housing stays static at best and housing costs continue to rise. Um, this is going to continue to be a growing issue that's going to require a high level of engagement from all of us and all of our roles. Um, so. The other thing that makes this uh, a little bittersweet is this will be, you know, the mayor makes the proclamation and uh, many of us as council members and I acknowledge Councilman Scala who's come for the event today, um, pinch hit for the mayor. And uh, so this will be my last um, Bob McDavid proclamation. <clears throat> so certainly have, have appreciated uh, Bob's, Bob's work. So, uh, Whereas on April 11th, 1968, the Fair Housing Act was signed into law by President Lyndon Baines Johnson, and whereas a strong community requires quality education, good jobs, and a sound financial base, which all start with access to decent, affordable housing for all citizens, and whereas discrimination in housing or lending and homelessness negatively impact the overall well-being of the community, and whereas Chapter 12 of the City of Columbia Code of Ordinances makes it unlawful for any person to discriminate in housing or lending against an individual because of that individual's familial status, race, color, religion, sex, national origin, ancestry, marital status, disability, sexual orientation, or gender identity, and whereas the City of Columbia's 2016 to 2019 strategic priorities include social equity to strengthen the community so all individuals thrive by supporting neighborhoods, increasing home ownership, and increasing the stock of affordable, energy efficient, and universal design homes, and whereas the City of Columbia, Missouri is committed to the issue of fair housing for all of its citizens, now therefore I, Robert McDavid, Mayor of the City of Columbia, Missouri, do hereby proclaim April 26 as Fair Housing Month in the City of Columbia. So thank you again for coming um, and, and, uh, and for, for appreciating and celebrating Fair Housing Month and learning more about the issue today. And we'll turn it back over to Rose. Hi, we have a few housekeeping things I forgot to mention earlier. If you need the bathroom, it's out the door to the right by the elevators. Snacks and refreshments will be in 1A and 1B throughout the event, and there will be a break for snacks and refreshments later as well. We did um, have surveys, so we do appreciate your input. If you can complete the survey before you leave, and there's a basket uh, box at the back for that. Okay, um, and cell phones. If anyone has their cell phone on, if you could please mute it, that would be appreciated. Our first speaker is Professor Rigel Oliveri. Professor Oliveri is a nationally recognized expert on fair housing laws. She graduated from the University of Virginia and then attended and graduated from Stanford Law School. She worked as a trial attorney for the U.S. Department of Justice and Civil Rights Division, Housing and Civil Enforcement Section. She litigated a number of significant cases involving housing discrimination and sexual harassment in housing. In 2003, she, the Attorney General of the United States awarded her a special commendation for outstanding service. She joined the faculty at the University of Missouri School of Law in 2005. Her scholarship 
and research focuses on housing discrimination, residential segregation, zoning and property rights, and sexual harassment. Her work has been published in many scholarly publications, including the Stanford Law Review, the Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review, the Florida Law Review, the Wisconsin Law Review, and the Vanderbilt Law Review. Professor Oliveri. Oh, and there will be a time for questions with each speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Rose, um, for uh, that introduction and for inviting me to speak today. Um, as you could probably tell from my background, I'm really into fair housing. <laughs> um, and it's been something that I've been uh, studying and practicing in uh, and researching in for a long time. Um, so my talk today, I was originally asked to address the issue of assistance animals and the fair housing laws, um, which I am going to do, and that's the bulk of my presentation. But I also heard um, that there were some questions about this very recent um, HUD uh, guidance that has come out about criminal background checks. And I'm happy to address that as well in the question and answer part. Um, so I'll, what I'll do is I'm going to start with just a basic background of what the fair housing laws are. I'm sure we're mostly familiar with them, but just so that we're all on the same page. And then I'll talk specifically about assistance animals, and then I'll leave time for questions about that or um, HUD's new guidance or anything else. Um, so let me just get my... So to begin with, um, oh, and I should also apologize, my slides that you're going to see on the screen are slightly different from the ones in the packet. I, I added a couple of things after I'd already submitted them to the printer. Um, and I will blame the fact that when I originally had to compile them for the printer, it was spring break and I had two small children climbing all over me while I was trying to work. Um, and I only realized afterwards that I'd left some things out. So they'll be slightly different, but mostly the same. Um, so the, the Fair Housing Act, the Federal Fair Housing Act that we just heard about that was signed into law in 1968, um, makes it illegal to do a number of things with respect to housing based on protected characteristics. So the things that are illegal to do, um, and I've got the statutory sections written down there. That's what those numbers are. Um, they are uh, they're, they're in reference to the Federal Fair Housing Act. But it's to deny housing or make housing unavailable. That's probably the biggest one. Um, to impose different terms and conditions on housing. To make or publish discriminatory ads or notices with respect to housing. Um, to misrepresent the availability of housing to someone. Um, you know, to tell a housing seeker, sorry, we have no vacancies when in fact, you know, you do. Um, it is also illegal to discriminate in residential real estate transactions, such as financing, appraisals, brokerage services. Um, those are the main ones. There's also uh, a section, it's section 13, uh, 3617, that makes it illegal to harass or coerce or intimidate somebody um, with respect to housing based on a protected characteristic or based on their attempts to help someone else exercise their rights to fair housing. Finally, um, there's one particular part of the law that makes it illegal to fail to give a reasonable accommodation to someone. Um, that one only applies to disability. All, the, all of the others apply to all of the protected characteristics, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, but this one little part, 3604F, only applies to disability, the reasonable accommodation requirement for reasons that hopefully will be obvious, um, only applies to that protected characteristic. Um, so those are the main things that it is illegal to do. The protected characteristics under federal and state law um, are these, race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, which means um, being the guardian, parent, um, custodian of a child under the age of 18. Uh, and that's kind of a unique one. That's only in, in fair housing law. No, there isn't any other... Uh, civil rights statute that contains protections for familial status. Um, and then the final one is handicap. Handicap is the term that the statute uses. I prefer to use disability, um, and that's what I'll be using for the rest of this. And then as you probably heard in the proclamation, 
Uh, the City of Columbia has added additional protected characteristics to, in its code of ordin ordinances. And so those are sexual orientation, gender identity, and marital status. So those are not protected by the federal law or by the state uh, civil rights, human rights law, but they are protected by the City of Columbia. Um, finally, before I get into the specifics with assistance animals, I just want to mention the theories that Fair Housing Act cases can proceed under, the way these cases can come to court, um, are disparate treatment, which is sort of a classic civil rights violation where you know two people are treated differently intentionally by a landlord or a real estate agent or some other housing provider. You know, the Hispanic tenant is told, no, there's, uh, the Hispanic rent applicant is told, no, there's no vacancies. The Anglo white tenant is told, there's plenty of vacancies. Um, things like that, just sort of straight up treating similarly situated people differently on the basis of a protected characteristic, and that usually is intentional. Um, I, I guess we're going to hear about implicit bias a little later, but um, most of the time uh, in the law, it is an intentional act. Disparate impact is a little bit trickier, um, and it was more controversial. In fact, the Supreme Court only just last July upheld the use of this theory. It had been in wide use in fair housing law, but the Supreme Court had never weighed in on it, um, and so it got challenged, and the Supreme Court did weigh in and did decide um, that, it, that this theory could be used. The way the theory works is it's when there's a facially neutral practice or policy or rule or what have you. Um, so it's not something based on a protected characteristic, but it has a disproportionate effect on people who are group members with these protected characteristics. So like a classic one would be, an example would be something like, I don't rent to people who um, have changed their name. Well, that's probably going to affect women more than men, because women are much more likely to change their names when they get married um, than, than men are. Not that men can't, and not that people don't change their names for other reasons, but a rule like that, even though it doesn't seem like it's based on gender, is going to hurt one group more than the other. And there's defenses to that, which I can get into a little later. Basically, you are allowed to have such policies if they serve a substantial, legitimate, non-discriminatory purpose. Um, but um, that's kind of that's where that's where the arguing tends to be. So that theory is acceptable. Um, it had been, it's been used since the inception um, of the Fair Housing Act, but the Supreme Court finally gave it the definite thumbs up last July, um, and that's what the HUD, HUD's new guidance based on criminal background checks uh, implicates: is the disparate impact cause of action. Finally, the final theory that Fair Housing Act cases can be brought under um, is failure to make a reasonable accommodation um, for people with disabilities. So um, that's what I'm going to move into talking about now. And in particular, I'm going to talk about the reasonable accommodation of an assistance animal. There are lots of accommodations a disabled person might need to use and enjoy housing, um, ramps for someone that uses a, a wheelchair, you know, various things like that. Um, but assistance animals tends to be the one that creates a lot of controversy. I know in years past um, at this, this very seminar, there's always been a lot of questions about that. So I'm going to focus specifically on that. Um, and so it, the, the way the accommodation process comes into play is a landlord or housing provider has a no pets rule, or no pets over a certain size, or no pets of certain types. And a disabled person who uses an assistance animal needs to have an accommod a reasonable accommodation to that policy to allow him or her to reside with that animal uh, in the housing. And so to begin with, we need to, we need to get clear on what an assistance animal is under the law. And HUD has provided guidance that says an assistance animal is any animal that provides assistance um, or performs tasks for the benefit of a person with a disability. So that would be kind of a classic, you know, um, a, a seeing eye dog or something along those lines. But it also includes an animal that provides emotional support that alleviates one or more identified symptoms or effects of a person's disability. And so that is what we would call an emotional support animal. And people with PTSD, 
people with anxiety disorders, depression, sort of a variety of uh, maybe less obvious disabilities may rely on these animals to help them, you know, get through the day, navigate, navigate life, uh, what have you. And so one thing that's important to note is that this is broader than the definition of service animals that the ADA uses. Um, and we all may not be intimately familiar with the ADA, but the ADA deals with um, things like public accommodations, restaurants, movie theaters, um, buses, things like that. Um, the Fair Housing Act deals with housing. And so the ADA has a narrower version of what counts as, they call it, a service animal. So under the ADA, a service animal is, has to be, sort of, it usually has to be a dog, um, and it has to be specifically trained to provide specific services. It does not include emotional support animals. The Fair Housing Act does. And there's reasons for that. Um, reasons that I've read you know, include things like, you may not need to bring your emotional support animal with you to go see a, a two hour long movie, um, but you may need to have that emotional support animal living in your home with you. Um, and so there's reasons to kind of be more restrictive when it comes to taking, to going to various public places and to be more expansive when it comes to animals that a person might need to have in their home. Um, so an assistant animal can be just about any kind of animal, um, it can, as long as it provides some support or assistance for an individual with a disability. So the way this works is an individual with a disability who wishes to get an accommodation from a no pets policy um, needs to ask for it. Um, and it is best if this is done in writing. Um, the, you know, the lawyer, any lawyer will tell you that that is a good thing so you can be very clear on what was requested and when it was requested and all of that. There's no confusion about what was said or anything. Um, but it doesn't have to be. The statute doesn't require this. HUD's guidance doesn't require this. Um, the, the request should include the reason why, should include three things. It should include what the disability is, the reason, or the requested accommodation, and then the reason why the accommodation helps the person with the disability. Sort of, what, why is this accommodate, why is this animal necessary for this particular tenant? It is good for landlords to have kind of a nice process that tenants can use to ask for a reasonable accommodation. It's good to have a form or some kind of set procedure, mostly just, again, for kind of record keeping and, you know, so the tenants aren't confused about what they need to do. But, and HUD's pretty clear about this, it, you can't deny somebody an accommodation just because they didn't go through that process, just because they didn't fill out the right form. Um, <laughs> That is not grounds for denial. It's just a good thing to have. Um, OK, so when you get an accommodation request as a landlord, you basically have to ask two questions. You have to say, you know, does this person have a disability? You know, have they articulated a, a disability? Um, and a disability is defined pretty broadly as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. But major life activities can be anything from walking, um, communicating, hearing, seeing, um, to interacting with people. Um, so it, it, major life activities is pretty broad. And then does the person who's making the request have a disability-related need for the assistance animal? If the answer to both of those questions are yes, then a reasonable accommodation to a no pets policy must be granted. Um, you know, there can be a dialogue between the landlord and the tenant as far as, you know, making sure that the accommodations request can be done in a manner that is, works for everyone. The landlord's allowed to kind of make sure that it's going to be something that's not going to create problems. But for the most part, the landlord needs to grant that accommodations request. Um, the person must be allowed to live with the animal use the animal in all parts of the property that other tenants are allowed to go. Um, and it can't be something where the tenant has to pay a deposit or an extra charge or anything like that. Even if the landlord normally has a pet, de pet deposit, um, someone who's using an assistance animal sh should not be required to pay that deposit. Because really, the animal is not a pet. Um, the animal is an assistance animal. Yes?
talking about the the animals. What if it's an animal that's a vicious animal, like a uh, pet bull or, or wet, uh, what they call wet water? Right water. Right water. Right water. What if it's something, you know, an animal that's vicious? So, um, the, there is an exception if the specific animal in, 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 at issue um, is, would be a danger to the health or safety uh, of anybody, then it is allowable to deny the reasonable accommodation, or okay. to de deny that. But, so the right thing. but, well, what I want to be clear, though, is that what you can't do is just have a blanket breed ban. So you can't say no pit bulls or no Rottweilers. Um, the determination about whether there's a specific threat posed by the animal has to be made with respect to that animal. So has this animal ever bitten anyone? Has this animal ever, you know, chased anyone around and barked at people or, you know, done things that would indicate that it poses a threat? So you can't just decide kind of at a distance that all Rottweilers are, are going to be dangerous or all pit bulls or all German shepherds or whatever. Um, it has to be an individualized focus on that animal. Um, yeah, the, the HUD guidance is pretty clear that there can't be sort of just a blanket ban on breeds. Okay. Um, right. So, thank you. Yes. Say that, uh, like nursing homes, places like that, were also included in this of not having to pay extra for pet care or something like that. It, so the, like the the nursing home and, or or residents of the nursing home. Would that be, um, you know, and I'm going to be honest, I am not sure if there's some additional, you know, there, if there's medical facilities involved, that might pose some different issues. Um, but in general, sort of just a tenant who's renting an apartment where there would normally be a pet deposit shouldn't have to pay that if it's an assistance animal. Um, yeah. Um, so, but I, like, as I was uh, uh, sort of segueing into, there are some exceptions. And you know the, the landlord doesn't have to grant the reasonable accommodation if this specific animal appears to be dangerous or would pose a threat. Um, if there is you know some sort of serious financial or administrative burden that would be caused by having the animal, it's hard to see exactly how that would be the case. But the, the statute and the guidance provides exceptions to the to grants for uh, requests for reasonable accommodation when it would create a specific problem. Um, when the animal seems like it's going it, to, you know, we, when you've got a specific reason for thinking the animal's going to damage the property um, or pose a threat to others, then the landlord is entitled to say no. Yes? When you talk about health um, issues that it may cause to other residents, um, what if, are animal allergies going to rise to that level? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that might, I mean, and that's it, that, that is an issue where, I mean, the ideal thing is, when the request is made, if the landlord has a concern, like you know the you know the tenants on either side have pet allergies, um, then what we hope, what the statute hopes and HUD hopes, is that there will be sort of a dialogue between the tenant and the landlord, where they can figure out a way to, you know, to accommodate the request, but also not, you know, not create problems for other tenants. So is there a way to? reduce this harm to others, would it be as simple as, you know, like this tenant needs to move to a unit that's, you know, in another place? Or, you know, will we put special filters into the air system that don't cost very much money, but that could eliminate some of these problems? Things like that. I mean, the, the hope is that there, even if there is a problem, that hopefully there, this is a problem that can be worked around with some rational, you know, human Interaction. I know that always doesn't doesn't always happen, but that's the ideal. Is that if there is a, a, an, a, a potential problem, that the landlord will try to work with the tenant to make it make it work, and not just say, "Nope, there's someone allergic in the building; you can't have it." But is there a way that you can still have it, and we can uh, mitigate this problem? So just to make sure I understand this correctly, there cannot be a flat denial because, say, the tenant next door has a pet allergy; they have to still work with them mm -hmm. trying to make something out. Yeah. That would be the the ideal, and, it may, and maybe there is no way to work it out. You know, I'm not saying there could never, but you should at least try. There should be some attempt at um, find, you know, making the accommodation work. Can a landlord 
pets? So, of course, landlords can have no pets policies, but they have to accommodate assistance Someone animals. Okay. Right. right. So, yeah, you could have a building that otherwise has no animals in it, but um, you would have to accommodate a reasonable request for uh, a disability related request for one. Yes. Yes. He starts barking at any time. They are to call 911 because it's a medical emergency. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been denied uh, housing because no pets. Mm -hmm. He's not a pet. Right. He's pet. He's a service animal. Right. And uh, there's been, uh, complaints because he barks. Well, that's what he's doing. He's saying, Gene needs help. Mm -hmm. And it's been ignored. And I've been kicked out of housing because of his parking. Oh. Yeah, and that's and that's really illustrates the problem really well, which is that if people treat the, the presence of the animal as if it is a pet, then that's not, the animal's not a pet. The animal's doing, doing its job. And sometimes the job is to alert. Um, is to bark or to you know do something. Sometimes the animal um, needs to be. This is here. This kind of goes to the breed distinction. Sometimes the animal needs to be a really big dog. Um, a lot of apartments will have you know no dog, no dog. You can have a dog, but it can't be over 25 pounds. Some people need an assistance animal that's really large because that animal might need to help subdue them if they have a seizure. Um, might need to perform some functions. And I'll use an example. We, at the law school, we had a student who'd done several tours of duty in Afghanistan and had PTSD, traumatic brain injury, the nicest guy in the world, but he could have these horrible seizures where he'd go, he'd, he'd kind of go crazy and he'd kind of lose, you know, his mind would kind of blank out. He had a giant dog with him at all times that would kind of herd him over into a corner and sit on him and calm him down. And that dog needed to be big because this guy was really big. Um, and so there's, you know, different animals can f perform all sorts of different functions and, you know, and you may love the animal, but it's not your pet. It is a worker animal that assists you. Um, and, and that's the kind of the mindset that, that we need to keep in mind. Yes? Isn't that example part of the failure of the accommodation to carry on this discussion? Discussion between the landlord and the tenants, and yes. so on and so forth. I mean, in some cases, I suspect that the landlord is, is an maybe an absentee landlord, and some other cases not. But there apparently is no communication between the other residents who don't understand mm -hmm. that that's the vital function of that service. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's and you can see where there might be if there's an animal that barks a lot, where other tenants may have an objection to the sound. Um, but that's that's where the dialogue should come in, and that's where we can try to, you know, how can we how can we make it so that this is you still have your assistance animal and others aren't disturbed by it, and you know we hope that that's a process that both parties can interact in in a civil way and not be antagonistic. Um, there's someone in the back who's been in regards to excluding certain animals. I've been told by our insurance that there are certain breeds that we're not supposed to allow. So, mm -hmm. if we happen to allow that and something happened, I guess we could say that's uh, violating the federal law. Yeah, I mean, I've heard this before um, about insurance companies, and really, that that is not consistent with with the law. I mean, I, I think that isn't. I don't want to kind of give what would be considered formal legal advice, but to me that sounds like an unenforceable contract provision because it violates federal law. Is that in regards to the insurance or just in general? Like if, if in general we can say no pit bulls, but if it's a, a, a service animal that's a pit bull, that's right. what they couldn't. Then you'd, have to, then you'd have to accommodate it. Um, I want to talk for just a second because I know this is something that comes up about what sort of inquiries the, the housing provider can make once they get uh, a request for a reasonable accommodation. Um, you know, so maybe the request contains all the information the, pro the housing provider needs and they're satisfied with it, um, but it may not. You know, you never know kind of what people will, might write down and, and send in to you. Um, if a disability is not readily apparent, and there's plenty of disabilities that you can't see, um, 
then the housing provider is allowed to ask for the tenant to submit some reliable documentation of the disability and why they need an assistance animal to help them with that disability. So they're allowed to ask that question. If the disability is obvious, I mean, if it's the person uses a wheelchair, um, you know, the person is blind, um, then the housing provider should, but the, but the need, for, oh, sorry, I, I, I got into the wrong example. If the disability is obvious, but the need for the animal is not, then the housing provider is allowed to ask to provide documentation of the need for the animal. Um, but the housing provider should not ask an applicant or a tenant to provide documentation showing a dis that there's a disability or a disability-related need for an animal if this is obvious, if it's readily apparent. So that would be someone who's, who has, you know, uses a wheelchair who has an animal that needs to do things for them or someone who's visually impaired and has a dog that needs to do things for them. Um, and also, and this is a pretty important one, once you get whatever the, you know, whatever you make the inquiries that you need to establish the person has a disability and they have a disability-related need for an assistance animal, then you need to stop asking questions. <laughs> um, where you can get into real trouble as a housing provider is if you sort of harass the tenant to provide lots of detailed medical information that's not necessary to make the determination of whether the person's disabled and whether they need to use an assistance animal. Um, there is a, a recent case out of Florida that was up at the uh, Federal Court of Appeals in Florida where this condo association asked this guy to provide a complete list of medications that he took, um, the number and duration of counseling sessions that he'd had, his treatment plans going forward, lists of every doctor he'd seen. I mean, this really excessive amount of information that was not necessary. Um, he'd provided a doctor's note saying he had PTSD and needed to have an animal, and they should have stopped at that point. Um, so be, and, and then, and when you do get information about, um, a, a, for a disability accommodation, treat that as confidential. Um, housing providers may also get in trouble if they run around and tell everybody else in the building, did you know so-and-so is, you know, that's not, that information should be kept private and confidential. Um, a few other points to make that the assistance, an assistance animal does not have to be specially trained or certified. And this is, this is something that I think hangs some people up. They, you know, might want to see, you know, the official training certificate that the dog has been through a program, you know, to help it be a service animal. And certainly there are those. I mean, for, there are specially trained service dogs um, that do very specific functions. But the whole point of an assistance animal, particularly one that can provide emotional support, is that they don't need specialized training. Um, the animal, uh, you know, may be an animal that is just, this animal provides this support to this person. Um, they didn't go through a formal training uh, process or anything like that. So that is, uh, certainly if someone can produce such evidence, that should be sufficient, but it's not necessary. Um, and then as I was saying, sort of breed, breed size and weight limitations should not be applied to an assistance animal, even, um, you know, even where otherwise you might have a ban on pit bulls or something like that. Um, so I'm just going to show you, this slide is not in your packet, but it is, I wanted to add this. Um, all of this information is contained in two rather lengthy documents that HUD has put forth. They're on the internet. Um, one is just about reasonable accommodation generally, sort of how you ask for it, what you do when you get a request. Um, and that's from May 2004, and that was a joint statement of HUD and DOJ Civil Rights Division. Then there's some more recent guidance on assistance animals particularly, and how they relate to housing particularly um, from 2013. So that is all um, publicly available and you can find it and consult it. It doesn't answer every question, um, but it's got a lot of useful information in there. Yes? Uh, as you can see, the disabled ladies here, they have a reflective material on the back. Uh, mm -hmm. What's to say the uh, individual with the dog can be issued a special Obvious, seeable, reflective item that is placed on the animal, so all the public knows that is a special dog. Oh, I see. So, like the other tenants don't say, "How come this person gets to have a dog and I don't?" 
example is the handicapped individual's car. We now can take a blue device and hang on the device, and that means that car is now handicap accessible. If it needs to be temporary, then it is. It's permanent, put it on the animal, and leave it on the animal at all times. You know, I mean, I, I don't know that that, I can't think of anything off the top of my head where that would be a problem. On the other hand, you know, if there is an issue, you know, if it's an animal that can't or doesn't want to have to wear something or anything like that, you know, that would be a dialogue that I think the... Does it be illegal to put it on a certain dog, dog that's not qualified? In other words, there's going to be a fine fall if you have that on your hands. I, you know, I don't want to speak to the legality of putting things on animals just because, <laughs> I mean, you can put whatever you want on your, your animal probably, but it's more, you know, if a landlord were to say something like, you know, how about, how about your dog has an orange collar so that people know, you know, that, that it can be, you know, marked as being a service animal so other tenants don't start thinking they can bring their dogs around or a special, you know, tag from the apartment complex, something like that. That would be a dialogue that I think. A little card says, here's my proof. But, I mean, and that's, you know, and that's the landlord is allowed to ask the, the pet owner, you know, where, or the assistance animal owner to provide the, you know, the evidence that, it, that there's a, a disability related need for the animal. But if you, if you're talking about sort of a signal or a marker that the, the animal is officially allowed by the apartment complex, you know, I don't see, you know, off the top of my head, I can't see a reason why that would be a problem, but that would be a dialogue they'd want to get into. There might be a reason why they don't want to have that, um, you know, that I can't, I can't really anticipate, but that would be a good, that would be a good dialogue for the two parties to engage in. Did you have a, an answer to that or? Most all people that use service animals do know to have a uh, harness on them that says I'm a service animal. Don't pet me, I'm right. working when they have them outside of their apartment. Yeah, and some of these animals will almost always just, it may just be inside the apartment a lot of the time. There could be cat, I've, you know, cats can be assistance animals. Um, you know, there can be, I've, I've sort of seen a whole variety of, of types of assistance animals that are other than dogs. They're in the back here. I'd like to ask a question in regards to the confidentiality of a disability. How do you dis discreetly tell other tenants the reason that person as an animal, when saying that it's a service animal, points out the fact that they have a disability which is supposed to be confidential with the landlord. And so, I mean, I think there, what you know, what you would have to do is just say, you know, we have a reasonable accommodation to disability procedure as we are required to do by federal law and leave it at that. Um, okay. And don't get into, this is the person's disability and this is why they need the animal. But just say, you know, there's federal law requires us to make a reasonable accommodation for assistance animals and leave it at that. <laughs> Can I ask a question about shelters? Oh. So I, I work with homeless individuals, mm -hmm. so I'm working extensively with, with property owners and, and, and housing individuals in the community, but also with, with crisis shelter situations. Yeah. And uh, we work with veterans, so mm -hmm. the vast majority of them have some sort of mental illness, PTSD, mm -hmm. running the whole gamut, um, yeah. a lot of our veterans do not even want to go to a shelter if it means they have to be without their animal. Yeah. Uh, and we've run into a lot of issues negotiating with shelters about people being able to have those animals. Is yeah. there something that we can do? And, and again, we're a team of licensed clinicians, so mm -hmm. it feels very simple to put something in writing speaking to the fact that someone has a disability. Are shelters also obligated to accommodate this. So, well, so shelters are covered by the Fair Housing Act, um, but you know here I'll, I'm going to back up a little bit. You know there is uh, under the exceptions for the requirement to grant a reasonable accommodation is you know if doing so would impose an undue financial or administrative burden or would alter the nature of the services. So you know if you've got a lot of people in close quarters and there's a lot of turnover and there's not a lot of room for animals to go out and go to the bathroom and, and you've got people with allergies or, you know, there, there may be reasons why it is, it would be an undue burden for the shelter, depending on the kind of shelter that it is. Um, so I wouldn't say that there's, you know, they, they are covered by the Fair Housing Act, but they may have a, a legitimate reason for not being able to, to do that. So. Mm -hmm. Is it still okay for a landlord to 
enforce um, normal pet policies for PSAs as they would other pets on property, so pet waste, being on a leash, that sort of thing? Yes, in terms of, yes, the sort of cleanup after pets uh, and, and that kind of thing, yes. Um, you know, it may be that, I mean, yeah, leashed pets in common areas, unless there's a reason why the pet can't be on a leash. Um, I mean, I say pet, assistance animal, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't be on a leash for some reason. But, but yeah, cleanup and that sort of thing would be a, that you are allowed to have reasonable uh, regulations that would apply. Right, so if the animal does create damage, if the animal does, you know, cause problems with the carpet or, you know, something like that, yes, you, you know, then the, then the person can be required to uh, pay for, the, for any damage. But what the person can't be required to do is put up a deposit ahead of time. There's all of that. Okay, there's another back there. I have another question about the um, service animals, pet bull. I want to make sure I'm getting the right understanding. If it's a service animal and it's a pet bull, is it against the law to say, no, we can't accept it? I understand that. If it's an applicant that's not disabled and it's not a service animal, can we say, no, we don't accept? vicious animals oh yeah yeah i mean you can have no pets policies you can have pet restriction policies for breeds and size and stuff like that um you just have to make an accommodation to those if there's a disabled person with a disability related need for them <laughs> were you aware of the brochure that the disabilities commission and a group of ot students put together uh, to hand out to businesses and other people regarding what is a service animal and that type of thing. It's a very good brochure. Oh, it was never codified in actual ordinance, mm -hmm. but it is informational and is available from the city. Oh, good. That's good to know. I'm, I was not aware of that specific thing now, but I'm glad. Um, and like I said, I mean, the HUD guidance is there, but it's you know, each one of those things is like 13 pages long and you have to read lots of jargon to get through it, but um, I'm glad to hear that it's been put in a more user-friendly format. Yes? How, how, how would you handle a situation if a service animal had live offspring? Wait, I'm sorry? How would you handle a situation if a service animal had live offspring oh in a my. unit? <laughs> oh, God. Um, I have never had that question before. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, 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 that is a, I mean, that's an interesting situation. One would hope that doesn't happen, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess you could, I mean, unless they have a disability related need for all of those offspring, they would need to get rid of them um, as quickly as, you know, practicable, I would think. Um, they are puppies or kittens, yeah. and they are in need of that mother. I, I, I honestly don't know. You know, that would probably be another dialogue situation where you say, okay, you, you know, until they're weaned or until they can be adopted, you know. I would assume that. Uh, I don't know that the landlord would need to help get them adopted, but I, I you know, I would think that that would be a something that you should dialogue about. I mean, clearly, if the, if the person probably does not have a disability-related need for all of the, the puppies, um, uh, you know, then that would not be part of the accommodation. But they're there, and so one would hope reasonable human beings could just work out a solution that, you know, doesn't require three-day-old puppies to be thrown out on the street. <laughs> um, I don't know that the law specifically addresses that. I think that's just part of the the dialogue yes uh, for the service animals protection it's best to be neutered yeah. and spayed yeah and I, th I think that is that's why if it's a real if it's a real assistance animal it's probably not going to one would hope not be in this position <laughs> yes 
Uh, good morning. Um, how do you effectively fight those people that are not disabled, but they come up with a certificate off of a website saying that they are, mm -hmm. and they have their piece of paper in hand and their dog, and they come in, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you have two or three other residents that saw that, and they come in with the same certificates going, well, we have our certificates too. So I think here the, uh, the, the operative language is reliable documentation of a disability. Um, I mean, if it's not an, a readily apparent disability, if it's something you know, invisible or just not obvious, um, and someone's coming in with something that does not strike you as reliable, um, you as the landlord would be entitled to make that determination. I don't think this is reliable evidence. If it's, you know, a form printed off a website where they wrote their name on it, that's probably not reliable. And, and you know, that's not to say they may not fight you about it, but I think that's why that, that language, uh, why HUD is using that language to say, you're allowed to ask for reliable proof or reliable evidence. Um, and so if they come up with something that doesn't strike you as reliable, the landlord could say, I don't, I don't think this is reliable. I think you're, you know, this this is just your attempt to bring your pet in. Um, but like I said, that doesn't mean they might not still fight you. But the, that would be the argument that that I would make as a landlord. I'd say this isn't reliable evidence. You need to come back with something better. Now that, that doesn't mean you can get into unreasonable inquiries about I need every doctor you've ever seen and every medication you've ever taken and you know, things like that, but you're allowed to ask for reliable evidence from. So you can ask the document, right. saying it, that he, that particular tenant has some kind of disability. It's, it's more, you should ask for some reliable evidence. And so that could be from a doctor, uh, it could be from a therapist, um, or a counselor, or something like that. It, it doesn't have to be from a doctor, it just has to be reliable evidence. It could be from a caseworker. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be from a, from a medical professional, but it should be something that is reliable. Well, let's put it back into it with the advent of desktop um, oh, publishing. Mm -hmm. You have some very professional software packages that are reg readily available at the education, university, colleges, mm -hmm. and you can see some mighty professional fake documents and they look, they've got the letterhead, they've got the explanation and the wording that could be copied from one letter to another, mm -hmm. and the doctor scrawl is a scrawl that you would normally mm -hmm. see from another doctor. Mm -hmm. Can I call up the doctor and say, hey, do you have this person as a patient? Uh, how, do you, how do you effectively? Yeah, you can't, that, that will never work, because uh, there's, there's, there's HIPAA and there's medical uh, privacy. Um, you know, I, I, it is true that people can falsify all sorts of things. I am, I'm a professor. I've seen forged doctor's notes for why they couldn't take the quiz that day. Um, I do not think it would be advisable, you know, if I'm a landlord, to, to go around questioning the veracity or validity of documents like that. I just think you could, that, that, that would not be an advisable course of action. If someone provides something to you that looks reliable, you can decide, you can decide not to accept it. You're just, oh, excuse me, exposing yourself potentially to, uh, you know, a lawsuit or something like that. So, uh, I'm not saying that you have to take it. You can, it's a decision you can make as a landlord, but you'll be on thin ice if you start saying, "I don't believe this doctor's note." I'm gonna, you know, make further inquiries to the doctor. The doctor probably wouldn't talk to you to begin with, but um, without a signed HIPAA release from the patient, so. Yeah. Could you possibly request that the documentation comes from a person qualified to diagnose the disability? Because you said you could get it from a caseworker, but mm -hmm. caseworkers can't diagnose. Can, could you make that stipulation that it would have to come from a qualified Again, person to make the qualification? You know, I, the, so the, the, the statute doesn't, the, the guidance doesn't say that. Um, the guidance says just reliable evidence. So, reliable 
I think that you might be on, and I'm reluctant to give any specifics, right? I mean, there's some, the, the statute, the guidance is what it is, and we have to just kind of figure out what that means. Um, but most people uh, in the fair housing community think that this means that it does not have to come from a medical professional. It just has to be something that is reliable information. So if you were to require it come from a certain type of person, that you know, there might be other reliable information about a person's disability and their need for an assistance animal that doesn't have to come from a doctor or a treating doctor or a diagnosing doctor. Um, the person does have to provide evidence of their disability, um, and that's most likely going to come from a doctor. But like I said, you know, a caseworker could say this person's been diagnosed with X, Y, Z, and that's why I work with him. Something like that. Yes. Would it be fair then for a landlord to ask for something that was, um, in, in as far as something reliable from someone local, instead of something that someone could just print off a website? You know, if it's a local doctor, then you know you know that the doctor at least exists, mm -hmm. right? So I, I mean, again, I would just be reluctant to say it's got to come from any particular kind of doctor or a doctor that you know or a doctor that you don't know. I mean, if it's real, you know, if it's unreliable on its face, if it is something printed off from a website that says, you know, insert your name here, then I would probably be skeptical of it. But if it's, you know, if it doesn't look unreliable uh, or untrustworthy, I, you know, it, it would behoove the landlord to accept it and not to question it or provide or require further because that's where some of the problems come, where the landlord starts saying, well, I want more information. I want you to give me a complete list of doctors, or th that, that is when, yeah, and it can be, you know, uh, harassing and onerous to the, to the tenant, so. Uh, um, I think one of the biggest concerns is, of course, after allowing the pet in or um, after allowing the pet in or, or getting the documentation, whether you believe it's true or not, one of the biggest concerns is when they leave, the damage that may be left behind. So um, I think instead of like maybe being so aggressive and forceful up front, how do we kind of combat that problem at the end if the pet has damaged the apartment um, or the home? Are they still assessed the same fees that any normal renter would be? Um, do you maybe have them sign something in the beginning, a pet agreement or pet policy that says, you know, you didn't have to pay any pet deposits or monthly pet rent, but in the event that your pet does cause damage, you are fully responsible? Well, so, you know, what you can do is make the, have the tenant be responsible as any other tenant would be for damage to the apartment. And so whatever the normal damage policies are, you know, they, they can be responsible for that as far as do, you know, the security deposit gets taken or they have to pay extra if something gets destroyed. Um, that, is, that is okay. Um, I wouldn't make that person sign extra documentation saying, yes, I agree to be responsible um, or anything like that. I would just apply the normal kind of policies, you know, for move out damage to the, to the unit. Yes? The puppy scenario brings up a question about how many animals are reasonable. And that is, you know, that is again not a settled question. I mean, it's whatever that person needs. That person may need more than one animal. They may have an inside animal, and then they may have an animal that they take out with them when they go places, and those may be two different animals. Um, again, they'd have to provide a disability-related need for why they need each one, um, or why they need to have both. I mean. So you know, I, I I couldn't say off the top of my head that there's just only one animal because there may be a, a need for someone to have more than one. Um, certainly, if things start to get out of hand, I mean, a the person may not be able to provide a reliable indication of a disability-related need to have ten different animals. <laughs> um, you know, that's probably that seems unlikely to me, and it would be difficult probably for somebody to justify that. You might also then get into you know, the reasonableness of that accommodation, you know, may, provi pr may prove an undue burden on the landlord. We can accommodate your need for one animal, but not 10. So even if the person does show they have a need for 10 animals, the landlord would probably be on pretty good footing to say this poses an undue burden on, you know, on our housing to have this many animals in this space. So. There's sort of two, I think, backstops against someone getting too excessive with that. One would be the need to prove that they need it, and then the other would be if it does get too, to be too much, the landlord can say this is an undue burden. 
Is there a protection specifically for people that train service animals? I had recently a resident contact me. We had said he had an illegal pet or an unauthorized pet and he provided a tag um, and it looked official um, just stating that he does train service mm -hmm. animals um, periodically and that um, he was exempt from fines and fees and I had my, our attorney look into it, but it was like real gray. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if there's like specific protection for that. So there, is, there wouldn't be under the Fair Housing Act. The Fair Housing Act only protects the disabled person, not, not somebody who would be in that position. I don't know if there are other laws, uh, other state laws or something that would, pro that would provide that protection. But the Fair Housing Act, that's not included in there. That falls back on the ADA law for disability acts. For the for the trainers? Oh, okay. Um, okay, well, I if I I've got about 10 more minutes, and I thought what I might do is talk about the criminal background check issue, because um, um, I know that that's, it just happened. Um, this guidance just came out on April 4th. <laughs> um, in part, what this guidance, uh, this guidance comes out because disparate impact was upheld by the Supreme Court, because it's a disparate impact issue. So if if a landlord has a policy where they will not rent to anyone with a criminal conviction, um, that is going to have a disparate impact on racial minorities, in particular um, people who are black and people who are Hispanic, who are, have historically been uh, and continue to be arrested and convicted and incarcerated at much, much higher rates um, than their representation in the population and proportionate uh, to uh, white people, basically. Um, and so, but these policies are, have been fairly common. Um, I know many landlords and housing providers have that as part of their background check. If you have a conviction, you, you can't rent there. Um, what HUD has said now by coming out with this guidance um, is that such blanket bans on renting to someone with a criminal conviction will likely violate the disparate impact provision of the Fair Housing Act or the disparate impact theory. Um, the reason is that, so we know that, that those create a disparate impact, first of all, that's kind of the first step. We know that they do. Um, the next step in a disparate impact analysis is to say, you can, you know, this policy still might be all right if it is necessary to achieve a legitimate, substantial, and non-discriminatory purpose. And so I know many people will say, well, this does serve a very important purpose of tenant safety. Um, we don't want to have a criminal element coming, renting in an apartment. The other tenants won't feel safe. You know, the landlord may not feel safe. Um, and so that would be sort of the articulated reason for having such policies. The problem is, is that a blanket policy may not actually serve that purpose. Because if someone has a 20-year-old conviction for shoplifting, you know, when they were 19, and now, you know, they're pushing 40 and they've had an otherwise clean record, um, it, it, it may not serve any real purpose to ban that person um, from an apartment building. Um, it's not going to, you know, that person probably does not pose a risk to the safety of the other tenants, um, probably isn't going to do something like steal or, you know, harm the property. Um, and so what HUD is saying is they want people to adopt, they want housing providers to adopt a more individualized assessment rather than just have a policy that has a blanket ban, anyone that's ever been convicted of anything can't live here instead to make a more individualized determination or maybe have a policy that says, you know, if you've had a conviction in the last five years um, or if you've been, ever been convicted of a crime of violence, something like that. But to just have a flat ban that, that may not serve those purposes of tenant safety 
um, HUD says, is likely to create a disparate impact without really serving a legitimate purpose. There's a couple of um, points then to make on top of that, <laughs> which is, one is it is okay to deny a person housing if they've ever been convicted of drug sale or manufacturing. Um, that is a really big one, um, I mean, that HUD uses. Um, that doesn't include just simple possession, though. So there may be people who have drug possession convictions, but they didn't manufacture or distribute. Um, so they shouldn't be lumped into that category. But it is OK to have a blanket ban on drug sale and manufacture convictions. Um, a couple of other things just to, that, that, that HUD makes clear. They say you should never consider arrest history because arrest history is not really indicative of anything. If it's an arrest without a conviction, that means nothing. And there are definitely groups of people who get arrested at a much higher rate without having engaged in any criminal activity. Um, and so arrest records alone shouldn't ever be used. It should only be convictions. Um, and then here's probably the trickiest part. So HUD says make an individualized determination. Make sure that people are, you know, if you're excluding someone, it's because you really think that they pose a problem and not just because you're, you're creating this blanket ban. But you also have to be careful to treat similarly situated people equally. So you have to be careful not to let uh, what we might call intentional discrimination or disparate treatment sneak in. So if you're going to let a guy with a 10-year-old shoplifting conviction rent and he's white, you should let a black guy with a 10-year-old shoplifting conviction rent. And then sometimes you may not have identically suited people, but they may be similar. And so HUD wants landlords to strive to treat similarly situated people the same, even as it's asking for these individualized um, assessments. I mean, I know a blanket ban is the, probably the easiest thing, because then you just don't have to worry about that. Um, but HUD wants landlords to, to do that, and that's a heavier burden. Um, on landlords, that's that it is. Yes. What about sex, sex offenders may have their own. I mean, they they often will have their own limitations on where they're allowed to live based on state law. That isn't. I won't rent to you because you have a conviction of a sex offender or child molester. Sure. I mean, it, the landlord can make a can make individualized determinations or more particular rules. I won't rent to anybody who's had a conviction in the last year, because um, I think they might be a threat or something. But what you can't have is just a blanket ban on anybody who's ever had a criminal conviction. It has to be something that achieves a purpose of you know, safety or you know, the reasons why you might not want, you know, if you want, if you want to exclude someone, there should be a, a reason other than just a blanket ban. So yeah, it's, if you think that anyone ever convicted of a sex offense creates a, you know, a, a threat to other tenants. I mean, like I said, a lot of times if someone's on the registry, they can't live in certain places. Um, so um, that and that's a that's a sort of a separate legal framework for them. But yes. Yeah, you said it's hard to stipulate any of these examples. Ah. Uh, you give Yeah, so there, HUD has guidance. It's, how many pages long is this? It's about 10 pages. This just came out on April 4th. Um, and so it's got some, it has, it just gives kind of vague parameters. So it says things like, you know, don't, don't have a blanket ban on convictions, but you can make individualized assessments if somebody's, you know, a lot of what they talk about is recency. You know, you can decide based on recency of, of the offense if you think the person is a danger or if the offense was a nonviolent one versus a violent one. Things like, those are the sorts of things. But it doesn't say specifically, you know, 10 years, 10 years or anything like that. It just says the landlord should make that determination. And that's a, I, I, I will admit, that's, I would not, that would not be a fun place 
for a landlord to be to have to make those kinds of determinations. I'd be, I would not want to have to do that. Um, that's tricky. So, yeah. yeah. Um, with respect to both the service animals and the uh, criminal background, um, there are a lot of uh, exemptions for kind of smaller one to four unit housing. Um, does that apply here as well, or are the one to four unit housing subject to these things you're talking about, just as larger complexes are? So the so you're there. There is an exemption called the Mrs. Murphy exemption. That's kind of the colloquial term for it. It's for when there are four or fewer units that are all contained, uh, that are all within the same building, and the owner lives in one of the units. That it used to, it, the idea was Mrs. Murphy lived in this building and rented out the three units to other people. Um, I don't know if Mrs. Murphy is a real person or not, but um, the, an exception was built into the law that those are not covered by most of the provisions of the Fair Housing Act, including making housing unavailable um, and reasonable accommodations, which didn't exist at that time. But those parts, no. So if it is a small building, if it's a small property and the owner lives in one of the units, they will be exempt from, from all of these things. But the owner has to live there. It can't just be a small property. It's got to be one that the owner lives in. I've worked with people with disabilities, especially hidden disabilities, for many, many years. I helped with passage of the ADA, many state laws and other federal laws. I found that if the landlord and the person just sit down and have a dialogue, that they can come to an agreement that's okay with both of them, doesn't require any going to an attorney or you know filing a yeah. suit or anything like that. So I would really encourage all landlords, as well as any people that are looking to rent, that are in the audience to first really try that dialogue mm -hmm. type thing. Yeah, the law it really wants lots that. Lots of times works. Yeah, that's the ideal. Time for one more, or I don't know if you want to keep me on time so I don't take up someone else's time. Uh, one, one more. Okay. Um, a lot of the fair housing is based upon characteristics that where people don't have choice. I was born this way, or there was an accident that made me this way. On the criminal impact, there's an element of choice. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, your leasing managers are trained a certain way, and those blanket um, rules are there to protect not only the owner, but the other residents in the community. Mm -hmm. A gut feeling that if a landlord slash through a leasing manager manager made a, uh, a mistake in who they rented to and if there was some let's say activity that affected the other residents in a negative way then does the landlord property owner then become liable because they made that choice to accept that particular individual into their residence so so like liability someone, law how do you think that's going to evolve you know gut feeling I, I i i honestly couldn't say i mean the landlord's uh good faith attempts to comply with guidance from hud uh you know is important i mean hud has given them requirements that they're that they should be more individualized and not have a blanket rule um, you know, any particular landlord's wisdom in how they decide to make that as individualized assessment is going to vary. I mean, if somebody, you know, makes, a poor, makes poor decisions and says, yes, we'll let in anybody now, I mean, that, that, could, that could create a problem. Although if they've got what looks like a sensible policy of, you know, allowing people to rent as long as their convictions aren't more than 10 years old and are nonviolent, it's hard to see how they would be exposed to liability if that person should happen to do something, you know, based on a 15-year-old shoplifting conviction. It'd be hard to see how, it'd be hard for me to see how a landlord could be held liable if that tenant then went off and committed some violent crime against another tenant. Um, so, I mean, I think any, every situation would be different, but the more reasonable the landlord is being, you know, the more likely it is that they won't have a problem. 
Um, but I, like I said, I, a, blanket, a blanket policy is, is easy, and I can see why a landlord would want to have that, so you don't have to make those dis individualized determinations. It's a lot easier. Um, but HUD is now saying that that's not, uh, that that's not acceptable. Um. Talk about liability law. What about discrimination? I, I this particular criminal background that just seems to open up all sorts of discrimination charges against landlords. How so? Well, you, you have this reasonable dialogue, and one party's not satisfied, you know, because the applicant. And is that, is his being, his or her being denied housing, is that considered discrimination? Could be considered discrimination? And also so, what uh, lawsuits? So the, so a landlord is entitled to deny housing to somebody for a legitimate reason, and, and certainly for a reason that's not one of the protected characteristics. What the landlord can't do is have a policy that disparately impacts a large group of people um, unless that policy has a good reason for existing and serves a specific purpose. So if a landlord undertakes the individualized inquiry that they now have to do under the law, um, then what the landlord has to do is just be careful to treat people equally and not treat sort of, you know, black people who have a record who are applying for tenancy different than white people with a record and try to treat them equally um, while still having an individualized assessment. Um, so it's not an easy place to be. I'm, I'm, and it's literally, this is less than a week old, so it's hard to know exactly. I assume over time there's going to be some standard best practices that people will that people will start adopting and, and that will be kind of approved of by courts and, and others. But right now, we, there's nothing. There's just this HUD guidance from April 4th. Um, and I should stop because I'm over time. But thank you all very much. Our next presentation will be from Eric Krikal. Eric earned his bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and a master's in public administration from the University of Missouri, Columbia. He, is he has been employed with the Missouri Commission on Human Rights for 37 years. He began his career as an investigator and is now the director of investigative operations. He oversees the agency operations statewide, assists in program development, strategic and budget planning, and acts as a liaison with the Missouri Attorney General's Office the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Come on up. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Awesome. Oh, <laughs> I can't beat that then. Okay. All right, so these are our objectives here today. We want to um, gain an understanding of what is and is not covered by the Missouri Human Rights Act as regards to fair housing and uh, learn about the complaint process under the act, you know, when a complaint is filed. And I'll provide some examples of some actual cases that the commission has received and offer a few suggestions for uh, best practices. But first, a little bit of history here. Um, this is a copy of the ordinance abolishing slavery here in Missouri. And we've used this uh, in some PowerPoints before, and I was trying to determine what the uh, actual wording of that was, and I was looking at it closely, trying to decipher that, and I looked at the last name there, and the person who signed it, and it was like, well, hey, that's my last name. 
So it turns out that my great, great, great uncle Arnold Creekle signed the ordinance abolishing slavery in Missouri in January 11th, 1865. And with that signature, uh, over 100,000 pe uh, people were uh, freed in the state of Missouri. This was signed three months before Congress introduced legislation to become the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery nationally, and that wasn't effective until December of 1865, so Missouri was way out front on in terms of abolishing slavery. Uh, this document uh, was saved from the original Capitol building when it burned down in uh, February of 1911 after it was struck by lightning. But from the burn marks on the side, you can see that it was just barely saved from the fire. Okay, a little bit more history. Uh, the Missouri Commission on Human Rights was created in 1957. It was going to be a temporary two-year agency meant to foster goodwill, understanding, and respect. Uh, it had absolutely no enforcement powers. But through the efforts of the governor at that time, it became a permanent agency. And in 1961, it received some um, enforcement power with the passage of the Fair Employment Practices Act, which uh, provided uh, for uh, filing of complaints, investigating complaints, and uh, going to hearing where discrimination was found. This bill, uh, or this law, prohibited discrimination because of race, color, creed, religion, national origin, and ancestry. Then in 1965, the uh, Fair Public Accommodations Bill was passed. It prohibited discrimination on the same basis in places of public accommodations. And it wasn't until 1972 that the uh, Fair Housing Act in Missouri was passed. And it prohibited the, the same basis of discrimination. It wasn't until 1986 that those three bills were recodified and put together into the Missouri Human Rights Act. And additional protected categories were, uh, were added at that point and some other important protections. The last big amendment there was in 1992 when the act was amended to make it substantially equivalent to the federal fair housing law, which allowed us then to contract with the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development. Here's a picture of uh, our first commission. So these were our first commissioners who were appointed um, in 1957 after the commission was created. Um, the, one of the men there to the left of uh, the woman uh, has got a very famous grandson these days. And uh, he's a, a radio talk show personality. Uh, that uh, gentleman there in the picture is Rush Limbaugh Sr. So his, yeah, his grandson, I think it's a little different than his grandpa. Um, the woman in the picture there is Lucille Bluford. And um, she was uh, a journalist, a civil rights activist, and um, quite, quite renowned. In 1939, she applied to attend the MU Graduate School of Journalism. And they accepted her. And so she went to enroll, and they determined, well, darn, she's black. So they wouldn't admit her. And so she sued the university and went up to the Supreme Court, and the standard that they used at that time was separate but equal. And so they said, well, let's look what is offered at the black university, at Lincoln University. And Lincoln did not have a graduate program in journalism. So they said, well, it's separate, but it's not equal, so MU, you've got to admit Lucille Bluford to your program. So what did MU do? They eliminated their graduate program in journalism. So they did not have to admit Lucille Bluford. Well, she went on to become a reporter for the Kansas City Call newspaper. She became the editor of the Kansas City Call newspaper and the publisher of the Kansas City Call newspaper, which is still in existence today. In 1984, MU recognized her with a medal for uh, an honorary medal in journalism. 
uh, distinguished service in journalism, and in 1989, they gave her an honorary doctorate degree. So she finally did get her graduate degree from MU in journalism. All right, the commission uh, strives to prevent and eliminate discrimination. So we try to prevent discrimination through education, outreach, and training, and we try to eliminate discrimination through enforcement of the Missouri Human Rights Act. These are our commissioners and executive director, and we're supposed to have one commissioner appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate from every congressional district in the state, and we don't. So we don't quite have a quorum right now, but um, it is my understanding that the governor is about to appoint two more commissioners, which would give us a quorum, and hopefully uh, next week or the week after, uh, they'll be confirmed by the Senate, and uh, we can get back to uh, doing official business. Okay, so. What is covered by the Human Rights Act? Well, it prohibits discrimination in housing, employment, and places of public accommodations, okay? It prohibits discrimination because of race, color, religion, national origin, ancestry, sex, disability, age, and familial status. So national origin is somebody's country of origin when they're born in another country. Their ancestry is that they're born here, but they have the physical, cultural, or linguistic characteristics of a national origin group, like Mexican Americans, Italian Americans, Chinese Americans. Now sex, sex covers gender discrimination, pregnancy discrimination, and sexual harassment. It does not cover sexual orientation. All right, age applies only in employment. Disability is covered in all three of the areas of housing, employment, and places of public accommodations. And familial status, the status of having minor children, having custody of minor children, is for housing only. That is the most recently added protected category in the uh, Fair Housing Act and the Missouri Human Rights Act. Now, there's some additional protections in the law, too. Associating with a member of a protected category is protected from discrimination. So we might have a situation where we've got a mixed-race couple, and the white spouse goes to look at an apartment they want to rent, and everything's going fine until the African-American spouse shows up, and they don't get to rent that apartment. So race and race association could be a situation, there could be disability association. So association with one member of a protected category. Um, that association discrimination is prohibited by the law. Now retaliation is very important protection also because the law says, hey, you cannot retaliate against somebody for filing a discrimination complaint. Assisting in the investigation of a discrimination complaint or hearing or opposing a discriminatory practice. So that's really important protection because, you know, would you want to file a, say, a sexual harassment complaint against your landlord if they could evict you for doing that? So retaliation protection is important, but it is just not retaliation in general. It is only for filing a discrimination complaint, assisting in the investigation of a discrimination complaint, or opposing a discriminatory practice. We have work sharing agreements with the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and uh, the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development. So what that means is that these federal agencies have determined that the Missouri Human Rights Act is substantially equivalent to those federal uh, civil rights laws. And so we have work sharing agreements whereby somebody files a complaint with us, it is automatically filed with HUD or with the EOC or vice versa. So it's one-stop shopping to protect both your state and federal rights. <clears throat> 
It is also a way that we can divide up this common workload and make more efficient use of our scarce resources. So that means, you know, in terms of HUD, they've determined that the fair housing sections of the Missouri Human Rights Act are substantially equivalent to the Federal Fair Housing Act. So, you know, they prohibit discrimination in the denial of housing, the terms, conditions, privileges of uh, sale or rental of housing. Uh, we have the same design and construction requirements of accessibility in the Missouri Human Rights Act as in the Federal Fair Housing Act. Um, there's a prohibition against discrimination in the real estate transactions, in particular lending, and prohibition against discriminatory advertising, and you know the requirements for reasonable accommodation or reasonable modification are there too. Okay, so in fiscal year 2015, uh, we closed a total of 1,423 cases. So that's, that's a lot of cases for a small agency. 84% of those cases were employment cases. So that's the majority of what we do. And there's about 8% housing cases and 8% of our public accommodation cases. Now, many of those housing cases um, deal with rental, you know, the terms, conditions, privileges of rental, or the denial of rental. So we don't get a whole lot of cases dealing with sale of housing, and if we do, a lot of times that deals with the lending aspect of that. Some of the recurring issues we see in housing complaints are service animal situations. Um, we also see, uh, surprisingly, uh, a lot of issues dealing with disability parking spaces. So that comes up a lot too. Familial status um, is, is fairly common also in terms of our housing complaint load. So retaliation allegations are on 43% of our complaint forms. Now that's pretty wild. 43% of the complaints allege retaliation. 33% have an allegation dealing with sex discrimination. 28%, 29% deal with race. 23% disability, 19% age, and then smaller percentages for the others. So that adds up to more than 100 because we typically get more than one allegation on a complaint. We might have somebody filing a complaint say, hey, I was sexually harassed by the maintenance men in this apartment complex. I complained to management and they terminated my tenancy in retaliation for complaining. So you got several allegations there, sexual harassment and retaliation. Okay, in terms of determinations, uh, about 38% of our investigations found no violation of the statute. 32% people requested what's called notice of their right to sue. 7% settled, and we found probable cause in about 2%, and 20% were other kinds of administrative closures. So the Human Rights Act provides what's called a private right of action. So if somebody wants to not go through the complaint investigation process with the commission, and if they want to go straight into court themselves, they can request a notice of right to sue. And we'll close the case, give them their right to sue, and it's like their ticket to file suit in court, but they have to do so within 90 days of the date of that letter. So almost a third of the complaints that are filed with the agency, people go out, get an attorney, and request their notice of right to sue so they can go sue in court and not wait for the commission to complete its investigation. Now, some of our strongest cases, you know, when they're initially filed, they either settle or they get a right to sue letter. And if they don't do either one of those, then we'll find probable cause on that later. So if you add those three percentages together, we got a kind of a merit rate there of 41% on our cases. Our complaint process is essentially divided up into four parts. We've got intake, investigation, conciliation, and public hearing. Only cases where we find probable cause at the end of the investigation will go to conciliation or public hearing. So sometimes it's just a two-step process. 
Okay, intake basically is when people contact our agency and hey, say, hey, I've been discriminated against, and we try to ascertain whether it is within our jurisdiction. You know, is it based on one of those protected categories, and um, do we have jurisdiction to deal with that? If we do, our intake people will um, assist them in filling out a complaint form and getting that filed. If we don't have jurisdiction, we'll try to refer them to someone that does. Time filing, okay? Statute of limitations for filing under the Missouri Human Rights Act are 180 days from the date of the alleged discrimination. So you got six months, 180 days to file a complaint. Somebody files with us on the 181st day, we don't have jurisdiction, so we have to close the case out. Um, HUD has a one year statute of limitations for filing, so they can take a complaint a whole year after the most recent um, alleged discrimination. So that's, that's quite a while. Now there are such things as a continuing violation of discrimination. Now most commonly that would be like uh, in employment, an equal pay violation, where a woman is alleging that she's paid less for doing the same job that males do, but she's paid less than the males. And with every paycheck, she's gonna be discriminated against. So that violation continues on through time. But in order to be jurisdictional, she's got to file within 180 days of the last, you know, paycheck, the last discrimination that she received. Um, some sexual harassment complaints, you know, hostile environment complaints are also continuing violations because they're made up of a series of harassing events. The commission offers an alternative dispute resolution process so we can try and resolve complaints right up front, right after they're filed. And we call that our early resolution process and we'll assist parties in negotiating possible settlement or you know, even do face-to-face -face mediation with the parties um, if they want to do that. We've got a relationship with MU School of Law Center for the Study of Dispute Resolution where they will do face-to-face -face mediation on some of our cases for us. So um, a respondent's potential liability is never smaller than right after a complaint has been filed. So if you're going to get it settled, that's a really good time to do so. And it, you know, it does give closure to uh, both parties on that and gets a resolution, complainant gets something, the respondent doesn't have the sword of you know, litigation hanging over their head and that type of thing. So in fiscal year 2015, the settlement dollars that MCHR got amounted to $2.4 million. And that's pretty good considering we have two staff people devoted to early resolution. We have the Center for the Study of Dispute Resolution mediating some cases, and we have some volunteer attorneys who act as mediators also in Kansas City and St. Louis. So that's uh, it's been pretty busy there. We cannot, however, force people to settle. So if they do not want to settle, then we investigate. And during our investigation, we're basically going to get the information we need to determine whether or not there's been a violation of the statute. It's really important that the parties understand that we're acting as a neutral fact finder. We don't represent either party. A lot of times the complainants say, well, hey, you're the Commission on Human Rights. You're supposed to be helping me. Well, at the investigation stage, we don't know if there's a violation or not. So our job there is to get the facts, get the evidence, and determine whether or not there's been a violation. If there has been a violation, then there's a state interest in eliminating the discrimination and getting a remedy for the victim of discrimination. But during the investigation, we're neutral. We just want to get the facts and make that determination. So after we receive a complaint, we send out the complaint to the parties that are named in the complaint, and we send the respondents what we call an initial respondent interrogatory, which is basically just a request for information. We say, hey, we received this complaint. You can see the allegations there. We have to investigate. The statute says we have to do that, and we want to get your position on those allegations. So send us your position on these allegations and supportive documents that you may have to deal with that. Once we get that response, then the complaint is assigned to an investigator, and they will then contact the complainant, interview them, 
say, hey, you know, get all the details of their allegations, but they'll also say, this is the uh, company's response, you know, do you have any rebuttal information for that? So, what is proof of discrimination? The, the civil rights laws have been on the books for quite some time, and so the courts have figured out ways that you can prove discrimination. And uh, one way to categorize it is through the type of evidence. You can have direct evidence of, discrimina of discrimination, circumstantial evidence, or statistical evidence. Now the direct evidence, you could call that overt discrimination. That's where the words or actions of the uh, respondent show evidence of their motive or intent to discriminate because of protected category. You know, recently we had somebody file a uh, familial status complaint because the landlord was trying to rent a one bedroom apartment and they put a sign out in front that said, you know, one bedroom apartment, no kids, no pets. So <laughs> we went and took a picture of the sign and you know, that was pretty short investigation. So that was pretty overt. Um, we've had another one that was a little less overt. Uh, it was also familial status. And uh, some woman, woman was trying to, she had a, a child and she was trying to rent this apartment. She goes there and looks at it and then the landlady says, no, we don't want to rent to you know, people with children. And so she calls her back later and gets her to reiterate that on the phone while she's recording it. So that too was a pretty quick investigation. So that's overt discrimination. You know, you got your smoking gun there. Um, circumstantial evidence is a situation where you don't have that smoking gun. You know, you have to infer from the circumstances whether or not the person was discriminated against because of their protected category or not. And so the usual circumstances you look at, like Professor Oliveri said, was you know, were, how did they treat people in similar situations? You know, did they apply the same criteria for, you know, whether or not they're gonna rent to this person? Did they do that with people of a different protected category? So unequal treatment, you know, if there's unequal treatment of similarly situated people, you can infer that that was caused by membership in the protected category. If they're treated the same, you infer that there's no discrimination. So that is probably the most common type of uh, complaint that we get is uh, uh, disparate treatment complaints. Now the statistical evidence complaints are those impact complaints like the uh, uh, <coughs> conviction history situation where a practice that's fair and form, that's applied to everybody, has a disproportionately adverse effect on a protected category. So it's fair in form, but it's discriminatory in effect. So motive or intent is not going to be relevant. You're just looking at their, the statistics to show that, hey, you know, blacks were screened out by this policy at a disproportionately higher rate than whites or Hispanics or, or what have you. So those are the three theories of discrimination and how we go about trying to do that, do our investigations. So documentation, so this is one of the, the, the best practice tips here. Document, 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 you know. Uh, provide documentation or keep documentation on all your interactions, uh, all the, keep all your applications of, of tenants, all your lease violations that you issue, you know. Then you have the documents to show, hey, I'm treating all these people the same. And if you get a complaint, then the investigator's probably going to ask for that. Okay, after we gather the information, we need to make a determination. If we're going to make a finding on the merits, we either find probable cause that there was discrimination or we find no violation. So if we find the evidence, you know, the preponderance of the evidence says no violation, we're going to close the case and we'll let the complainant and the parties know that we found no violation, but if the complainant wants to pursue it, they have the right to sue the respondent or respondents named in the complaint, but they have to file suit within 90 days of the uh, notice of right to sue, or the, uh, the closing letter. But if we find probable cause, if we find probable cause, then the case has to go on to conciliation. 
Now, complainants can bypass, you know, our investigative process if they want to get a lawyer and go and, and sue themselves. If so, they make a request for the right to sue. We close the case, give them the right to sue, and they can file suit in court. But where we do find probable cause, the statute says we have to attempt to conciliate between the parties. So we try and work out an agreement. There's a little bit more leverage at that point in terms of settlement because we have a uh, finding of probable cause. But again, we can't force people to settle. So if they do not want to settle, then the chairperson decides whether to dismiss the case or set it for a public hearing. Okay, if it does go to a public hearing, we will have a housing discrimination complaint. We'll have our housing attorney, uh, human rights attorney, uh, represent us and prosecute the case before the state's administrative hearing commission. So it is an administrative law proceeding, but it looks just like a court proceeding. And if the commission finds, or I mean, if the uh, hearing examiner there recommends to a panel of three commissioners, that there was discrimination, they can order the appropriate remedy. They can order damages for pain, suffering, humiliation, and deprivation of civil rights. But uh, with housing cases, they can also elect to skip a public hearing and go straight into circuit court. So they can say, hey, I am going to just have my case heard in court instead of going through a public hearing because after a public hearing, you know, an aggrieved party can appeal into courts. So sometimes they will go straight into court and skip the public hearing. This is a case that, that we had recently. This was a familial status complaint. Uh, Charlene and Benjamin Burke uh, had lived at uh, the McDowell's apartment complex for a while. And uh, then the McDowell's uh, decided to terminate their lease. They didn't renew it. And they didn't renew it because they didn't want to rent to families with children anymore. And so we went to hearing on that and uh, they were found guilty of familial status discrimination and they were awarded $10,000 in damages and uh, they were assessed a $1,000 civil penalty also. Next case here is a disability accessibility discrimination complaint. Um, the Hendersons, Scott and Jacqueline, were wanting to move into the Villa Roma apartments, but they needed a little ramp put into the building so that um, Jacqueline's wheelchair could get into the building where their new apartment was going to be. And the uh, Villa Roma apartments refused to put that in, and the Hendersons even offered to put in the ramp themselves, and they still refused to allow that, and so. They filed the complaint. We ended up at hearing. The Hendersons were awarded $5,000 in damages, and there was a $2,000 civil penalty against uh, the Villa Roma apartments, and they've appealed that. So we're in court on that still. Travers versus St. Ange, this was the case that had the largest award that the commission's ever done uh, in a housing case. They were a couple mobility impaired people who were living in an apartment complex. They put a ramp in so they could drive their you know, scooter from their car right into the apartments there and everything was good. Um, the apartment complex changed hands and the new uh, manager of the apartments didn't like their ramp, took their ramp down, put another one up and it promptly broke and so they had their son come out and put the old ramp back on, and that upset the uh, new apartment manager, so he took it down and threw it away. And so they're stuck in their apartments, you know, because they're mobility impaired. They miss doctor's appointments. Their families have to bring them groceries, and so finally they had to leave. They had to move. And so this is a case that elected into circuit court, and the judge said, well, <laughs> you know, this is so outrageous. Um, each one of you are going to get $50,000 in actual damages, and each of you are going to get $100,000 for punitive damages because this was so outrageous. So I know we're kind of running a little bit behind. This last case was a weird one, sexual harassment complaint, and uh, 
she and her boyfriend are renting a trailer from some uh, person, and this guy is trying to sexually harass her, say, oh, give me some sexual favors, and, you know, we'll cut the rent down, and uh, did some other stuff there. You know, she called the cops on him, too. They arrested him. And um, so finally, we were trying to get this case going at hearing, and they decided to settle. This landlord had very little money, so he could come up with $800, but he also had a lot at the lake with the trailer on it. So he deeded that over to the complainant to <laughs> remedy this case. So pretty unusual. Um, best practices, document, document, document. Treat tenants and applicants the same in similar situations and don't misrepresent the availability of housing. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Involved in making a decision when you go to a public hearing? Is it members of your commission or staff people or attorneys that you employ? Or <laughs> yes, yes, all of the above. All of the above. <laughs> right. When uh, conciliation fails on a probable cause case in housing, we get a legal analysis done by our human rights attorney and uh, then staff makes a recommendation to the chairperson, you know, based on that, and the chairperson then decides whether to set the case for hearing or dismiss it. Yes, sir. Um, on the, under, on page four, it talks about the age of, you know, discrimination of age. Yes. Um, it says that only 40 through 69 is protected. That's true. Why isn't it young? I mean, I'm well, confused. Well, the, the federal protected age group is 40 and over. Okay. Okay, and that comes from the Federal Age Discrimination and Employment Act, which was originally passed in 1967. It was amended during the Reagan administration to go 40 and over. It originally was 40 to 69. So in 1986, when age was added to the Missouri Human Rights Act, we added the same protected age group as under federal law at that time, 40 to 69. And two years later, then the feds made it 40 and over, and the state law has never been amended to do that. But it won't go to younger? No, it does not. So you've got to be a member of the protected age group to you know, have a cause of action for age discrimination. Yes, sir. Yeah, you mentioned that one of the uh, protected categories on the Human Rights uh, Act was sex, but did not include uh, sexual preference. Is that right? That is correct. There are bills in the legislature now and have been for the last 15 or 20 years to add sexual orientation or gender identity or whatever to uh, as a protected category to the Human Rights Act. Um, they haven't gone very far. You know, one year, a couple years ago, when Jolie Justice, Senator Justice, was sponsoring the bill, on the last day of the session, the Senate actually passed her bill. But it was the last day of the session, and they knew there was no time to, you know, get it over to the House and get it through the House. That's as far as, you know, any of those bills have ever gone. I have a question. Yes. Oh. Um, oh. <laughs> the... Uh, Mr. Mathis this morning said something about the uh, law in Iowa and they couldn't discriminate against people with Section 8. Did you hear him talk about that? Yeah, I did. Um, doesn't that happen in Missouri all the time? I've worked with people on Section 8 and it's almost impossible to find a place to rent. So mm. how is not not against the law here? I don't know about Section 8. Sir? Uh, my name is Michael Carney. I'm an attorney, the housing attorney over at Missouri Legal Services. So I deal with this a lot. Uh, there is no protections uh, for Section 8, housing choice vouchers, anything like that. So you can, you know, someone could theoretically go into a landlord and the landlord you know, could find out that they have that and say, no, we're not going to rent to you, and there's no protection for that in Missouri. So it's perfectly illegal, or perfectly legal to discriminate based upon that in Missouri. Great. Thanks, Michael. We're making Rose run around a lot with that uh, microphone. I, I want to say this referring to his question. Um, a lot of landlords say no to uh, Section 8 because of the damages that they have had in the past. And in the past, 
the public housing authority would pay for damages and they don't pay for them anymore. The tenant is responsible for it. So when the tenant moves out, most of the time they don't have the money and the landlord lose a lot of money on damages. Okay, thanks. All right, any other questions? Okay, oh, one more, all right. If somebody has encountered or has seen these types of practices in place, but it has deterred them from renting, um, what do you recommend? Um, should you report things like that or just go, go, move along? Go, go ahead and repeat the question. Didn't hear the first part. So I've been helping my parents look for a place to rent. And on Craigslist, there are so many of these violations that you see. What do you recommend if that's something that has deterred you from renting that place? They've gone elsewhere, but if they weren't directly impacted, by these practices, what do you recommend? Well, if some, you have to be, you know, aggrieved, an aggrieved party to file a complaint. But if there is somebody who is aggrieved from, say, some overtly discriminatory, you know, housing ad on Craigslist, that can make some pretty good evidence. You know, we use that in a case. Uh, it was national origin discrimination, and you know, we don't rent to foreigners, and so our. Complainant was a married couple, and uh, the wife was Filipino, and so boom, there you have it. So that turned out to be good evidence. All right, is everybody ready for a break now? Okay, me too, thanks. Okay, just a reminder, restrooms are out to the right past the robot in the elevator. There are refreshments provided by the Columbia Apartment Association and snacks over in 1A and 1B. We will reconvene at 1115 with a presentation from two women at Ohio State University, sorry, the Ohio State University, who will be presenting on implicit bias and they're gonna be appearing virtually. So if there's any technological glitches, I might have you snack for a little longer, but let's try and be back at 11.15. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we are going to start with a virtual appearance from two fantastic women from the Ohio State University. See, I remembered to put the in. Jillian Olinger and Kelly Capitosto. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly, you're going to have to say your last name. Capitosto. Okay, I got it right. Because this is a virtual appearance, uh, what we're going to need to do is to save questions to the end. And then when you have a question, we'll bring a mic to you so that they can hear you and they will be able to see you on this camera here. Um, we're going to be, Adam has is helping to make the te technology work, as well as the IT staff, who I appreciate immensely. So let's get started. Jillian has undergraduate degrees in sociology and economics with minors in cultures and communities and urban studies from the University of Wisconsin <coughs> at Milwaukee. She has graduate degrees in city and regional planning and in public policy and management from The Ohio State University. She is a research associate and project manager for the Opportunity Program at the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at The Ohio State University. She specializes in research relating to equity and housing finance policy, civic engagement, community development, and regional sustainability. She has researched and written co-written 30 publications while at the Kerwin Institute. Kelly is a graduate research associate working toward a degree in public administration. She holds a master's degree in school psychology. At the Kerwin Institute, her work primarily focuses on how implicit bias impairs individual decision making and impedes opportunity for advancement. They will be talking about their new research, and the recent research they're probably working on a long time, on implicit bias and its impact on fair housing and lending. Let's welcome them. Thank you so much, Rose. It's a pleasure to join you all um, this afternoon virtually. And this is my first experience doing a live video conference. So I apologize in advance if the screen gets a little crazier. I, I don't focus on the camera, so please bear with me. Um, but we're joining you today to, as Rose mentioned, talk about some of the recent research we've been doing around implicit bias and impact on fair housing and lending. But before we really delve into that, I wanted to give you a brief introduction into the Kerwin Institute, um, who we are and what we do. So Kerwin was founded in 2003 here at The Ohio State University 
in Columbus, Ohio as an interdisciplinary research institute. And our mission is simple, but by no means easy. Um, we, our mission is to bring about a society that is fair and just for all people. And our research is designed to be actively used to solve problems in communities. We work with an extensive network of colleagues and partners, ranging from other researchers to grassroots advocates, policymakers, and community leaders, both here at home, but also across the country. And we strive to not only inform the public of leading research developments, but to provide capacity building for allied social justice organizations and to influence policy, practice, and investment that support equity and justice. We focus our work in four primary domains, education, sustainable communities and housing, public and community health, and criminal justice. But two central concepts really guide our work, that of structural racialization or structural disadvantage, which is the process by which policies, organizations, institutions, systems, culture, and history all interact institutional domains to produce and sustain racial inequality. And our second framework, which is race and cognition or implicit bias. And that is really the cognitive processes that operate often unconsciously to differentially impact opportunities and the neurological responses to racial inequalities that create additional barriers to opportunity. And research shows that these structural and cognitive processes really work together across institutions and time to contract or expand opportunity. So before we delve into what implicit bias is, I, I like to present this image um, just to familiarize people with the concepts. So based on these images alone, which do you think is stronger, Hurricane Earl or Hurricane Bertha? Or do they look like they're about the same strength? Well, the correct answer is Bertha is stronger. She was a category three hurricane. Earl was a category two. But studies have shown that hurricanes with female names actually cause more deaths because people think of them as less dangerous. People also predict that a hurricane with male name uh, will be more intense and therefore more likely to evacuate. So this is really just a simple illustration to show how sometimes, even if we intellectually know that something is illogical, our brain can work in mysterious ways that we may not even be able to understand. Just like with questions like this one, sometimes our brains house hidden biases and along a range of categories, such as race, gender, sexuality, and we've absorbed these biases over time, but once we know about them, we can work to get rid of them. Sure. So Kerwin started getting involved in the implicit bias work uh, with this publication, The State of the Science. The State of the Science is our annual literature review delving into the implicit bias research in multiple domains, including criminal justice, education, and housing. Uh, we have published three versions so far, and we're working on our fourth one to be released in the next couple months. Um, so through this experience of publishing the literature review, we really got into uh, immersing ourselves in the implicit bias research. And now we're starting to work on more collaborative projects within Kerwin to add this implicit bias lens to um, the research domains that we've already built a lot of our work on. So before we get into the application of looking at housing with that implicit bias lens, I just want to briefly uh, describe what implicit bias is and get to some of the more important implications. So the Kerwin definition of implicit bias is the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. Uh, this definition is really getting at two main things. Those are the attitudes or evaluation and stereotypes or associations. These are just the positive um, or negative feelings that we automatically feel toward any given object and just the associations that we relate to that object. I like to use the example of coffee, because I really love coffee. Um, so when I see a cup of coffee, I just get an automatic warm fuzzy feeling. I don't actually have to logically think about that. And similar to when you see a Starbucks logo, you automatically think of coffee because you associate that concept in your mind repeatedly. Uh, we do this because of that repeated exposure. So now that we've talked a little bit about what associations and evaluations are, they kind of lend itself to talking about what the key attributes of implicit bias are. So implicit biases don't necessarily reflect intent. 
Um, many researchers think that implicit bias actually reflects our experience with the culture that surrounds us, rather than a motivation to actually discriminate. And when we talk about this, I just want to repeat over and over again that good people hold implicit biases, people that are trying to do excellent work within our community. Um, and these are just very subtle processes that exist. Um, and secondly, we generally tend to hold implicit biases that favor our own envy. As human beings, we're very egocentric in the way that we start to develop and learn these associations. It's through that lens that we uh, value the people that immediately surround us more positively than outsiders. However, there are some exceptions to this rule in terms of implicit biases for highly stigmatized groups that, uh, again, it really is just a product of our environment. So seeing other groups that are in power, that stigmatized groups often have a positive association for members of their out group if that out group is in power. And most importantly, implicit biases are not equal. In the same way that we learn these associations, the repeated exposure. We're able to unlearn them through uh, various strategies that we're going to spend some time talking about later within this presentation. So this is just another simplified version of the Kerwin lens for how we do most of our work, um, seeing structural discrimination and implicit bias. We're going to use this um, visual as a way to help organize our thoughts as we move throughout this presentation. However, in actuality, structural discrimination and implicit bias are two completely related concepts, and they can't be taken apart from one another. So as we transition throughout the work that we're going to talk about today, I just want to remind you that these two aspects are sides of the same coin, and that structural discrimination and implicit bias are the products of and contribute to one another. So why housing? As many of you know who are here with us this afternoon, housing and credit serve as powerful signals of life chances. The better one's access to these commodities, the better one's outcomes tend to be, and along a range of indicators. So better health outcomes, better education outcomes, better economic outcomes, and so forth. So we know that housing matters immensely. In fact, research shows that the most important indicator explaining the black and white wealth gap is years of home ownership. Over the past 25 years, for every dollar increase in income, whites have been able to build $5.12 in wealth, whereas for that same dollar, blacks have been able to only build 69 cents. So we also know that access then to these two commodities is not provided equally to all in our society. And instead, we have a remarkably racialized history defining who gets access to housing and credit, on what terms, and where. And what we find is that the production, the consumption, and the distribution of housing and credit have been and continue to operate as systems of social stratification. This process has unfolded in myriad ways, for example, through segregated land uses, the power of private and government actors to shape spatial patterns, and race and class conflict in many communities. Today, our neighborhoods remain marked by racial discrimination and segregation. For example, despite decades worth of fair housing and fair credit legislation, the dissimilarity index in the 50 largest metro areas remains stubbornly high at 59 and 60 and above is considered highly segregated. In other words, 59% of blacks would have to move in these metros in order for the population to be evenly distributed. Another way to think about it is that today, the average black person lives in a neighborhood that is 45% black. If we did not have segregation, that neighborhood would be only 13% black. And finally, on the screen is depicted two cities um, on the left is St. Louis, and on the right is Columbus. And the blue dots represent the black population, the red dots, the white population. So you can see very visually how spatially segregated our cities remain. So how is it then that we can have logged over 50 years of fair housing legislation and our neighborhoods continue to look like this? Well, we know the Responsibility is widely shared that both public and private actors and institutions are complicit. Historically, practices and policies such as restrictive covenants, blockbusting, and redlining for the segregation of housing and credit markets. But more recently, activities such as reverse redlining, with continued steering of home buyers to certain neighborhoods, and NIMBYism continue to really uphold these racial boundaries. 
And we have a pretty good understanding of how the structures and systems have in the past and continue today uh, to restrict housing and credit opportunity. And this history really continues to influence our decision making often in ways in which we aren't aware of or which we may claim are rational or objective. And while there are many explicit explanations for racial disparities in housing and credit, we are really beginning to better understand the role of our implicit biases. And this gives rise to Kerwin's uh, implicit bias in housing research agenda. We're taking a look at uh, three primary things, understanding lending discrimination, uh, the persistence of nimbyism despite growing need for affordable housing and then also taking a look at the moving to opportunity intervention and unpacking some of the outcomes that we um, have seen from that policy intervention but in the interest of time today we'll just be giving an overview of the lending information and nimbyism. So we'll look at a few of the structural factors at play in uh, lending discrimination before unpacking the implicit bias framework. And just to note that it's in no means exhaustive, but really just to kind of illustrate this link. So one of the first uh, structural aspects we look to is the influence of historic policy and practice and how the association between racial minority and risk was formed. How did it really become codified in practice? And we see it first in the early 20th century in local politics. So the first racial zoning ordinance in 1910 justified racial zoning as a public health and protection is issue. For example, in Baltimore at the time, the mayor stated that blacks should be quarantined in isolated slums in order to reduce the incidence of civil disturbance, prevent the spread of communicable disease into nearby white neighborhoods, and protect property values among the white majority. And this race and risk association would later become nationalized through New Deal legislation in the aftermath of the Great Depression, in which federal policy really institutionalized discrimination and segregation through the use of racially restricted covenants and redlining um, practices that were uh, embraced by the Federal Housing Authority. And you can see the excerpt on the slide here is giving guidance as to how to rate neighborhoods in terms of credit risk. And really the impact of FHA lending and the, its discriminatory practices can't be overstated. Between 1945 and 1959, a span of 15 years, less than 2% of all federally insured loans went to African-American borrowers. And during this period, almost a quarter of all new housing was federally insured. So it had an incredible impact in shaping development and access to opportunity. Basically, what these discriminatory policy practices amounted to was a form of risk containment to purportedly protect the value of predominantly white neighborhoods. The second structural aspect that we'll look at was is bank deregulation and subprime lending. Uh, which really perpetuated racial boundaries established in the 1930s. Uh, so in the 1930s with New Deal legislation, banking occurred within a more or less well-regulated landscape for about 70 years. Um, home ownership rose from 44% in the late 30s to 64% in the 60s. However, the federally regulated boundaries of the financial market our housing finance system would change markedly beginning in the 1980s with piece after piece of deregulation legislation. And while the intent of this legislation was supposedly to attract global capital to a competitive market, we also know that it opened the floodgates to unscrupulous practices. So in the early 90s, subprime lending was virtually non-existent. By the end of 2006, over $1 trillion in mortgage loans were subprime representing 13% of outstanding mortgages nationally. And there were no contours, racial contours to this market. In 2005, right at the peak of the bubble, 55% of black and 46% of Hispanic borrowers received high cost loans compared to just 17% of white and Asian borrowers. What we saw was that these previously redlined or excluded markets were now the epicenter of subprime loans and foreclosures. And what did this look like on the ground? How did this history manifest itself? Well, Kerwin did some research and analysis of um, the old redlining maps in Cleveland and compared that with subprime lending. And what that meant was that neighborhoods that were rated D or the lowest category in 1940 
were more than three and a half times as likely to receive a high cost loan 60 years later than a neighborhood ranked A. So when we're talking about the influence of implicit bias in lending decisions, um, we're really bringing in some of that history that Jillian shared with us and talking about how um, that conflation of race with risk is influencing individual decisions in the lending domain. So as we shared previously when talking as a brief overview of implicit bias, um, these biases form because of uh, our pairing of two concepts with one another. This is something that we call associative learning. So many of you may be familiar with the classic uh, psychology study of Pavlov and his dogs. So this is the same mechanism of which implicit biases are formed in which uh, the dog had seen two objects, the bell and the food, and these were constantly paired with one another. Because this uh, association became so solidified in the dog's mind, they ended up exhibit exhibiting a physiological response to the bell by salivating. And we know that, of course, humans uh, have the same fundamental learning process as exhibited by this research study. Um, however, in this case, uh, the history that Jillian brought in, we start to conflate um, racial factors and pair those frequently with the housing market. Um, so that they internalize and unconsciously associate neighborhoods of color with increased risk. When we talk about increased risk, we're also talking about economic risk uh, in lending decisions, and we're talking about just potential evaluations of how dangerous those neighborhoods are as well. So there are several studies that kind of uh, document this implicit tendency to associate race with risk in the neighborhood setting. Um, but all of them, there's kind of an, an underlying thread that people are using race and as opposed to logical criteria as a way to evaluate the neighborhood. Um, they're using the surface level association um, to make their evaluate judgments from as opposed to looking at actual property values or crime rates. Um, and again, it's just a very surface level association that can drive individual attitudes and individual behavior. So our second uh, research line was to really explore the persistence of NIMBYism. And understanding NIMBYism in the context of the key socioeconomic trends, I think, is really important. Um, first is the incredible demographic change that our country is experiencing. So more and more Americans are people of color and immigrants, and the communities that we work in are experiencing significant change. So by the end of this decade, the majority of children will be children of color. By 2030, the majority of workers under 25 will be workers of color. And by 2042, the majority overall will be people of color. At the same time, poverty rates, especially for children of color, are rising. In particular, concentrated poverty is growing rapidly. The number of people living in high poverty areas where that's 40% or more of the population have incomes below the poverty threshold, nearly doubled between 2000 and 2013, from 7.2 million to 13.8 million. And this is the highest number of Americans living in high poverty neighborhoods ever recorded. The third trend that we're looking at is the economic trend, that the, the continued uh, reliance on the service economy rather than the building economy. We really are seeing a polarization of jobs, growth at both ends, both in high-end, high-skill, white-collar, and the low-end service industry. But at this low end, uh, the weight, this growth does not come with livable wages for workers. The portion of households with middle-class incomes has steadily declined over the last 30 years, and income inequality is at an all-time high. We also have a generation of workers who are saddled with enormous amounts of student debt, which restricts their options, both in terms of mobility, but also in terms of home ownership. In fact, we have more than one trillion in outstanding debt in the US. And what these trends are really depicting then is that we have an acute need for affordable housing in many of our communities. And despite this need, opposition remains pretty firm. Developing affordable housing in neighborhoods that offer a wide range of opportunities, good schools, fresh food, safe parks, is the standard we should be pursuing to make meaningful inroads to closing the opportunity gaps 
Unfortunately, as many of you know, it's too often the case that residents in higher opportunity neighborhoods resist these efforts. And the, our previous discussion illustrated just how pervasive the race risk association is within the real estate industry. Um, but as Kelly alluded to, it's also very deeply entrenched in our collective subconscious. However, today it may be less about the manipulation and exploitation of white racial anxiety through practices such as blockbusting and more about community opposition to affordable housing or NIMBYism. But again, we wanted to ask, well, where did this attitude come from? How did this generate? And for many Americans, the terms affordable housing evoke negative images of public housing projects. And our approach to providing public housing in the past is in no small way to blame for some of this negative association of fear. So in the 1930s, while the FHA was redlining urban neighborhoods of color, the Department of the Interior was directing field officers to segregate public housing through a neighborhood composition rule. And what this rule stated was that whichever race had dominated the neighborhood before the units were built was the only race allowed to move in after the units were built. And this was really a political move to alleviate whites' growing fear of encroaching public housing and black residents. With the Housing Act of 1949, public housing morphed into the isolating high-rise projects that are in our collective conscious. And while there were many problems with the implementation of this act, in a nutshell, money and management were never sufficiently committed to these projects and as a result, most rapidly deteriorated into slums, effectively keeping African Americans out of emerging white suburbs, again, protecting the white neighborhoods through this hyper segregation. So, for example, in Chicago in 1968, fully 91% of its public units were in areas that the city readily acknowledged were soon to be or already on the ground. While the worsening social conditions within these ghettos, as they be known, would soon confront the general population in the urban rise of the 1960s in cities across the country. In their wake, tens of thousands of rioters would be arrested, hundreds injured or dead. And the Kerner Commission, which was charged with investigating the causes of the riots, would indict the United States as moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. However, these images really just further serve to reinforce Americans' perceptions of race and risk. So again, when we're talking about implicit bias and its implications on NIMBY attitudes, it's really stage two of the race, of race risk association that we talked about earlier in the London market. So before we get into what some of the literature says, I just want us to kind of spend some time thinking about this controversial statement, uh, question rather. Um, does someone's race indicate their worth? Now, of course, um, at surface value, none of us would ever uh, advocate for a statement such as that, and most of the United States population would never say that that is true. But based on the historical data and some of the information that we're all talking about today, we know that that's not necessarily reflected with how the uh, housing market is actually uh, manifested in time. So when we're thinking about questioning um, the implications of implicit bias and NIMBY attitudes, this is really a notion of privilege, um, not necessarily like what Jillian was saying, blockbusting or overt discrimination to try and keep people of different races and backgrounds out of neighborhoods. This is really a manifestation of privilege and maintaining the status quo that I'm going to be talking about in this portion, reflecting on how the bias management. So similar to the lending discussion, um, any, the collective unconscious, we all hold these implicit attitudes. And race influences the perception of neighborhood safety and neighborhood disorder. Again, um, people are relying on residents' race and, for, um, for, and these decisions other than logical sources, such as actual crime rates. We're going to talk about two different studies that really exhibited this tendency. So the first was conducted in a large metropolitan area and uh, was evaluating this individual citizens' uh, attitudes for public housing in Black Americans. And what they found is that people um, viewed these two identities as synonymous. There is a high association for Black Americans and the use of public housing. 
And what they found is that because both of these groups have such a history of stigmatization, that both groups, regardless of the actual race of the people living in the public housing, um, had a compounding stereotype of crime, laziness, and danger. The second study is relatively similar. Um, it was also conducted in a metropolitan area, and it was asking just an evaluation from whites um, on their projections for housing stocks in the neighborhoods. And they found that they were more likely to rate neighborhoods with black residents and it's less likely to appreciate and value. And they found this very striking, again, because the individuals were relying on those surface identities, such as race, as opposed to any factual or logical indicators of how that neighborhood is going to develop. So both of those studies are relatively straightforward and really reflect that association with race and risk in terms of NIMBY attitude. Um, but this one's kind of um, less noted in the research literature. So based on these NIMBY attitudes, we know that we're relying on illogical information that is oftentimes erroneous. So if we're relying on these implicit bias to inform NIMBY attitudes, they can actually cause communities and individuals to act against their best interests. So there was another study that um, was evaluating economic development and cultivating a diverse workforce. And they found that these pervasive NIMBY biased attitudes actually created a barrier for positive housing outcomes, even for those that held these attitudes against others. So this is really important for thinking of implications of implicit bias in the housing market in general. It's not just negatively affecting the target population, but that is certainly important. Um, however, these have rippling effects that affect all areas of housing development. So now that we spent some time talking about the negative implications, both structurally and um, internally with implicit bias, I just want to take some time to spend on how we can alleviate the impact of implicit bias in our lives. So similar to the other work that we've done, I'm going to provide some instances for how to alleviate individual implicit bias and also briefly take some time to talk about how we can um, alleviate implicit bias at an institutional level as well. So the first thing in any step um, is just being aware. So knowing your own bias is the first um, way to be able to combat them. So the best tool for doing so is an online resource called Project Implicit. And these are a way for you to test your implicit attitudes online. And it's a free website, and anyone is able to go online and take an implicit association test. Um, these tests were developed by two leading researchers, Anthony Greenwald and Mazarin Banaji, and they were kind of the first on the field to design any research related to implicit bias. And what they designed is a study that actually measures those associations, those pairings that we talked about earlier, based on the speed at which you group concepts together. So it's really a reaction time test. We're able to find out the weight and the severity of your implicit associations based on how quickly you group concepts into categories. So just as a quick discussion of the common implicit biases that all of us have, and particularly important when thinking of the implications for the housing market, that 70% of Americans have a pro-white racial bias, 72% associate men with math and women with liberal arts, and the same could be said for associating men with careers and women with the home. And ability status is a really interesting one. 76% um, of us have a preference for able versus disabled. And this is another really salient example of how we internalize cultural messages that reflect in our implicit attitudes. So for example, um, we have this mantra in the United States that we pick ourselves up by our bootstrap and our individual ability is going to drive our individual success, which is why this is such a pervasive bias in the United States compared to other places in the world. So once you spend some time uh, learning what your associations are, the next thing to do is just to know when you're most susceptible to relying on implicit biases. So we talked about earlier that these are occurring because of an underlying unconscious thought process. And our reliance on our unconscious thought processes are really driven by the fact that we have a very limited cognitive capacity to continue to be logical. So things like time constraints, being distracted, having a high degree of ambiguity or making judgment calls are really going to limit your cognitive capacity and be able to think logically. 
So we're not able to always eliminate our distractions around us, but this is just um, sometimes that we can really be more critical of the decisions that we're making uh, in terms of thinking about how bias may invade in thought, our thought process. So once you know what your biases are and knowing when you're more susceptible to relying on your biases, um, now is the next step where we seek out experience to combat our biased expectations. There's many ways to do this um, for thinking about implicit bias. Um, one of the most common and um, just common sense ones is thinking about Allport's theory of intergroup contact, um, mm -hmm. having collaborative um, working situations or living situations or we develop, develop these relationships with people from diverse backgrounds, experiences, et cetera. Um, there are several other ways that we can reduce our implicit biases. However, this is just one of um, only a few interventions that's actually successful at eliminating our individual bias or changing our negative biases to a positive one. Other things that you can do are getting back at that decision-making component, um, thinking about planning activities at your organizations, um, using flow charts, diagrams, other things to kind of take away that reliance on your associations and have you thinking more logically as you learn and navigate throughout the world. But I do want to take some time to talk about one particular intervention that is also able to uh, reverse our implicit associations, and this is mindfulness. So mindfulness is going to consist of these two uh, main components, attention and attitude. This actually occurs in two different stages. In the first stage, you're really integrating your attention with your attitude by bringing your awareness to your current experience, entertaining openness to new thoughts and interaction. This is really getting at that selective attention component and being able to refocus and reevaluate the world around you. At the second stage, once you're able to do this so often, you're actually getting better at regulating your thoughts, feelings, and actions. So you're able to see when you're feeling a certain way and be able to regulate that from moment to moment. And you're able to start perceiving your own judgments without um, negativity. So how does that actually eliminate implicit associations? So as we talked about previously, these are a really multi-stage process that occurs with, um, with multiple times of learning. So once we start improving that selection, um, improving that regulation, we're actually able to replace those associations because we're growing our cognitive capacity in those skills this entire time. We're able to focus on our effort on replacing those negative associations with positive ones. And here's just a quick list of recent research studies conducted in the last couple of years and their positive effects for reducing implicit biases. Um, so we're finding that implicit biases using meditation or just regular mindfulness has eliminated uh, negative associations for homeless groups, uh, black groups, and uh, people with different implicit race and age biases. Uh, the last study that I included was actually an academic intervention, uh, and I included it because it showed that using meditation, using mindfulness, actually had positive outcomes for the teachers that were engaging in mindfulness as well. So it not only affects, again, that target group and what you're wanting the result to be at your organizations, but it helps individuals internally be better thinkers, better decision makers, and better collaborators for your individual institution. So that kind of lends itself to talking about ways to eliminate implicit bias on an institutional level. So certainly you're able to implement, implement all of these individual um, interventions on a larger scale at your institutions, especially thinking things like mindfulness or creating um, ways to reduce ambiguity. Um, however, there's other specific ways that we can do this on a larger scale. And specifically, we want to talk about branding and messaging and who's successful or welcome at your organizations. This is really important for the community outreach work that all of you are doing and thinking about the implicit biases that may manifest itself in um, outreach materials or outreach efforts and just how um, you're targeting the populations that you work with. And most importantly is the opportunity to leverage organizational culture to pr promote diversity in the region. Um, we are talking about all of these ways to kind of reduce normative influence that's negative. If you create normative values that are focused on building inclusion, and that this can go a long way both within your organizations and within your workplace, thinking hiring more diverse um, individuals or in terms of that community outreach as well.
So this is um, the conclusion of um, the presentation portion. We just want to open it up to a question. And just to note, I know we covered um, a lot and kind of quickly, but the research, the full report will be available this summer. Um, and it will go, it goes into a little bit more detail um, with everything we covered and then a few additional things that we didn't have time to cover today, such as appraisal practice sort of thing. Um, if anyone has questions, if you could come up, they could actually see you. Want to come up, Don? Okay, I thought you had a question. Does anyone have any questions? Wow, no questions. All right. Um, thank you. Did you hear that? You got a compliment. It was very thorough. Thank you. Thank oh, you. <laughs> thank you. All right, I'm supposed to come up. <laughs> um, I, I know about The Ohio State University. My, my daughter graduated from there. She's a police officer in, in Columbus, Ohio. But, but it's just kind of an observation, uh, if you can see me. Um, and that is, a, it was an interesting uh, slide that you showed with, uh, with the, the two slides with uh, the storms on them. One, uh, one was named after a male and one was named after a female. But interestingly, part of the, uh, the artifact here was that there was a label over the one that was, uh, that was labeled as a female. So when I was looking at those, uh, those, that graphic, in fact, I was not paying much attention to what the names of the graphic was, but rather what was on the slide. Um, and I came to the opposite conclusion. And just masking those, uh, those uh, that, that the idea of those slides tended to do something about that implicit bias uh, that was characteristic of making that decision based on those storms. Just, just an observation, but I thought that that was kind of interesting because if you get rid of some of those labels and try mm -hmm. and look at what the data actually shows, um, it's a way of uh, really uh, eliminating some of the bias that you might have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's a really good observation, um, especially as we're talking about kind of these erroneous associations that we make. Some people may only look at the labels to their evaluations off of. So I think that's a really good example of how you're able to bring in more objective logical reasoning when you're actually taking time to look at the images as opposed to these labels that may or may not provide actual information. So thank you. Could you? Then they can see you and talk to you. Sorry. Well, just because nobody else is, uh, except Carl, is brave enough to say anything. One, one, the, uh, one of the slides that I thought was very interesting was the one that talked about people's attitudes towards race and people's attitudes towards people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to think of race as being the most intractable problem we have, but it's interesting that we tend to have even more of a negative attitude about people with disabilities. And I think your comment about uh, our sense that people should be able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps goes to the point that mm -hmm. uh, our, our culture gives us this uh, uh, implicit bias about people with disabilities. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if we're exposed to people with disabilities, we realize the, uh, the sort of uh, strength of character they've developed by dealing with the disabilities and what a great, uh, uh, well, fellow community member uh, uh, there is out there that we tend not to have an opportunity to interact with because culture keeps us from, from interacting. And this goes very close to what the, uh, uh, to, to housing sorts of problems, that mm -hmm. if we build housing in a way that people with disabilities can't normally take advantage of it, or it takes a major renovation to make it so people can get into that house, then we're not going to have those interactions we, we could have otherwise. But on the other hand, if we do some fairly simple, affordable things uh, in the initial design process, we come up with all housing being uh, open to virtually anybody to move in and just live in it. This is called universal design. Uh, we're seeing more and more of it. It's part of the, uh, the basic plans in the city. Uh, but it's important that people out there in the housing market, both those people making sales and those people shopping, 
realize that ah, if a house has universal design in it, it's going to be the sort of house that welcomes everybody. Uh, if, if our housing stock has universal design, then uh, we will have neighborhoods that aren't segregated on the basis of uh, uh, ability or disability. Disability is also interesting because, unlike race, it's something that goes and comes in the course of our lives. That right now, I'm, I don't have any disabilities. When I was 20 and had a broken leg, I had a significant disability. Next year, I might have a broken leg again and have a disability. As I get older, my disabilities are going to increase. So at some point, it's not going to be a matter of, to my mind, people with disabilities uh, opposed to those with disabilities, because I will be one of those people that was able and is now disabled. And we're all in this condition, that this is a case where uh, there isn't something that divides us, but it's something in the course of our lives. Uh, we participate on both sides. So if we see disabilities that way, we come, come to realize that, oh, we've got implicit biases against ourselves, against the people we're going to be at some point in our lives. Well, if disabilities affect us that way, even in a case where it's, it's a phony definition, a phony distinction, where really we are able and disabled in different ways at different times in our lives, what does that tell us about the implicit biases that deal with, with race? Well, it's the same sort of thing, except we don't go in and out of that category. That we have to uh, uh, realize that the same implicit biases that keep us from interacting with each other because of disabilities are just the same sort of things that will allow to affect us based on race, and we can overcome them in the same sort of way. And we can do it essentially, most practically, by looking for ways to interact with people who aren't like us. If we have housing stock, having policy, housing policies that tend to put us in mixed neighborhoods, then we're going to be able to overcome those things. If we allow ourselves to segregate ourselves, then we're just getting, we're setting ourselves up for more and more problems as time goes on. Thank you. Is there anyone else who has any comments or questions? No? no? Okay, thank you, Chel Kelly and Jillian. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. Let's thank them. Our next speaker and our last speaker of the day is Randy Cole. Randy has a master's degree in public administration from the Truman School of Public Affairs. He worked previously for Central Missouri Community Action as an energy conservation coordinator, where he oversaw the Department of Energy's low income weatherization program serving eight counties in mid-Missouri. Randy is currently the housing program supervisor for the city of Columbia. He oversees the city's affordable housing efforts as well as other community and economic development efforts funded in part by the Community Development Block Grant Home Program. Randy will be, will be presenting an update on the city's efforts on affordable housing. All right, uh, I'm standing between us and lunch, it looks like. So I'll try to move efficiently, but give the subject uh, its proper due and answer any questions we have. Um, so I'm Randy Cole. I'm the Housing Program Supervisor for the City of Columbia. So I oversee the city's uh, Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG dollars and home dollars, uh, that the city receives every year from HUD due to our population, uh, demographics, and the formula that ha HUD has, as well as what Congress authorizes every year. So today I'm going to talk about uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing, and in particular, what are the city's requirements since we are a, a recipient or grantee of, of, of HUD funds. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of our affordable housing needs, and then our current efforts to address those uh, housing needs, as well as what we're doing to affirmatively further fair housing. 
So we receive uh, annual funds, community development block grant and home funds every year, as I said, due to our population, uh, demographics and different indicators that HUD uses uh, to, for their formula, as well as what Congress authorizes every year. Um, so we receive CDBG and home. Uh, for CDBG, we, we receive about $835,000 a year. For home, we're right at about $415,000 per year. And as a HUD grantee, the city is legally required to affirmatively further fair housing. Uh, these requirements have been in place with the Fair Housing Act uh, for over 40 years. Uh, so it's something we've been required to do, just like all cities uh, across the nation and counties that receive um, HUD funding, as well as housing authorities. So uh, HUD released an AFFH, or Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Final Rule, uh, recently. Um, in the past, we've had to do what's called an analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. Has anyone heard that term in here? Uh, looks like a few people have. Uh, but we do a five-year consolidated plan that we're required to do by HUD, which basically uh, requires the city to look at what are our needs, what are our housing needs, what are the needs of low to moderate income citizens, and how are we going to spend our community development block grant and home dollars. Um, the analysis to impediments is supposed to be done on the front end of that to determine what are those barriers to, uh, uh, what are the fair housing barriers to low to moderate income citizens. So we did that, I did uh, participate in that and, and facilitating that process as we did our current plan. We're currently in our 2015 to 2019 year uh, plan and we did our analysis on the front end. Uh, several people here that participated in uh, some of those focus groups. A big part of what HUD wants us to do is to analyze data, to look at the needs, but also to include the public, uh, particularly low to moderate income citizens on our planning efforts. So the new AFFH final rule came out with some additional requirements uh, and guidance and tools for us to do an even better job of, of what we're doing in addressing fair housing. And the F AFFH rule um, requires us to look at how do we overcome patterns of segregation, how do we promote fair, fair housing choice for low to moderate income citizens, and how do we make sure we're fostering inclusive communities free of discrimination. And what the rule further, what it really does is it clarifies what does the city need to do uh, to adequately plan? Uh, what data do we need to look at um, to set our priorities and goals for how we use CDBG and home funds, as well as what local policies that we have in place to make sure we're not creating a, a barriers to fair housing and promoting uh, fair housing. So again, we look at, uh, through the new AFH, AFFH uh, final rule, they also included an assessment tool, which is very robust and very thorough and, and goes well beyond the analysis to impediments. And we look at what are the pa patterns of segregation and in, in, uh, uh, integration. Have there been shifts in different minority populations? Are there uh, concentrations of uh, minority populations in high poverty areas? Um, are there disparities in access to opportunities? Are there neighborhoods where there's not adequate access to quality schools, to jobs, to grocery stores? Uh, are there environmental hazards, uh, you know, closeness to contaminants or underground storage tanks or floodplain issues or things, things like that? And also, are there populations, uh, specifically, are there minority populations that have disproportionate housing needs? And certainly, we know, uh, you know, communities all across America, including Columbia, have disproportionate housing needs among minorities. So in summary, in my own words, what does the AFFH final rule do? Uh, it guides and requires the cities to assess fair housing needs in the community and do an effective job of it. Um, HUD came out with this tool to help communities do a better job uh, and help guide us to do a better job uh, to make sure that we're not just doing our analysis to impediments to fair housing just to check a box and put it on the shelf and, and demonstrate that we don't it. What they really want us to do is to use this tool and all the information they provide to make uh, really informed decisions with data that also link us, uh, that link to goals in our uh, action plan and consolidated plan as well as our local policies. Um, and luckily our current consolidated plan has several examples uh, that I'll talk about here in a bit how we uh, do that. So some examples of city efforts um, I talked about when we redid our consolidated plan. Uh, we. We looked at all the data for affordable housing to do our analysis to impediments, included a lot of public input and data analysis. As we do our plan in 20, 
for 2020 through 2024, uh, will be required to go that step further with the new uh, AFFH final rule and use their new assessment tool. So we'll be required to do even more, and uh, luckily HUD has also provided a lot more data and tools uh, for us to utilize. So some policies that we examined as a part of our last uh, consolidated plan, uh, just a few examples in particular, the Homeownership Assistance Program. We used to have a policy in place where uh, professional age persons uh, that were single were limited to uh, home ownership assistance in certain parts of the city. Um, as when I started, I, f I felt it was awkward to communicate that to people uh, of where our assistance was available. Um, also, it seemed like we were limiting one group of pop one population to one part of town. So we changed that and made our home ownership assistance program available citywide uh, for anyone that applies and is income eligible. We also uh, increased our assistance amount, uh, which has been really good. Uh, historically, a lot of our homeownership assistance has been more in the central city area. Certainly, there is a need for increased homeownership assistance in the central city area. But one thing, a result that I like that I've been seeing about increasing uh, the assistance amount is we've been seeing uh, participants buy houses in other parts of the city and the periphery in newer subdivisions and different areas so it gives people more fair housing choice uh, you could say uh, our rehab and repair programs used to be limited to the central city we still do do a lot of our work primarily in the central city but what we found as we analyzed the data is there were additional uh, repair and rehab needs on the periphery of the city again uh, there's there's older stock housing stock beyond just the central city so we opened that up and have been serving people citywide with that program uh, the, the third uh, policy change that we had as a part of our last consolidated plan uh, Don actually mentioned it is we implemented some much more robust uh, and formalized minimum universal design requirements so any new house that we construct with job point or habitat or say a private, a private contract, contractor now, will have zero step entrances, uh, wider doorways, wider hallways, uh, specific heights on uh, carpet pile height and padding, um, blocking in the bathrooms, uh, rocker style switches, um, the lever type door handles. And uh, it's, a, it's a very robust list that we started out small when we first tried it to just get the big things, the wide doorways, the zero sense of entrances. But we've really taken a, a many steps further uh, through the support of the Disabilities Commission providing input and, and a lot of Don loves input. So we're at a good point now. It would be nice if we could just do more housing units. Uh, <laughs> the fourth one uh, is kind of tangentially related, but I think it's related, especially when we talk about economic integration. Our community land trust efforts, we're still uh, in the process of trying to form a community land trust organization and do our first development over on Lynn Street. And basically what a community land trust is, is where uh, the city's looking to create an entity to maintain ownership of the land and sell just the structure. So that way we can control the long-term affordability of the, the property while allowing an ownership opportunity that may have not presented itself to that participant at a much re reduced uh, rate because we're not selling the, the land with the house. We're just leasing it through a 99-year ground lease. Um, so I th see this as a, a big opportunity to invest in our older parts of town, but also as new developments come online, uh, if we could work into some of these uh, land trust homes in these other areas, it gives people more choice of where they can buy new affordable housing. So I, I think it'll be a great opportunity to, for, for, to raise more choice. Um, how we specifically uh, use uh, CDBG funds in a more direct way for fair housing. Uh, we fund a portion of Rose's uh, position in legal uh, where activities are carried out are fair housing counseling, uh, outreach and education, events like this one. Uh, Rose has done a great job putting this event together. Um, also our fair housing testing project, we worked with Rigel, or the first speaker, uh, who worked with some MU uh, law school students uh, a few years back. And it's an activity that I think would be good to do every few years just to check in. Basically, she worked, had uh, some of her law school students of different racial backgrounds uh, go apply for rental housing in different places around town to see are there places of overt discrimination, is there implicit bias. Um, and 
The, the summary of that uh, test can see on our can be seen on our analysis impediments and document that's that's on our website. And what I gained from that uh, uh, testing project was that implicit bias seemed like to be the biggest problem around town that we just heard in our last our last discussion, where um, you know someone's interaction with a person applying uh, for housing might be different just because they don't identify with that person, or they might have some preconceived notions about that person. They might be less friendly. They might tell less information. They, they may hold themselves in a different manner. Uh, but we took the results of that fair, house, uh, fair housing testing project, and Rigel actually presented that to the Apartments Association. So it was a great way to see how we could uh, take a gauge for what the needs of the community were for uh, training in fair housing, and then actually present that to the people that have a stake in it. And it was, it was nice that we didn't use it as a punitive tool, too, I thought. It was more of a purely a learning and education uh, tool. So moving on to affordable housing, because uh, Rose asked me to, to talk about uh, what we do for affordable housing. So I thought it'd be good to first talk about what's, where are we at for the definition of affordable housing. And in red, I utilize HUD's definition, which is in general housing for which the occupants are paying no more than 30% of their income for gross housing costs, including utilities. I go a little bit beyond that because I think it's important to describe what populations are we talking about because certainly you could have someone that's at a higher income level that might be over that 30% mark that may, may have just overextended themselves. So when I think of affordable housing, I feel like we're truly looking at people uh, at 80% or below the area median income. Certainly, there's probably some people between 80 and 120 that um, are struggling with, with costs and housing costs. Uh, but for, the, for our purposes, and, and since that's what our HUD guidelines are for a lot of our programs, uh, I'm speaking of at 80% or below for owners, and then for renters, we typically are thinking of 60% or below the area median income. So what does 80% the area median income look like? For one person, the gross annual in income would be 40,600. Uh, for four persons, 58,000. Uh, these numbers will be updated by HUD, I would assume, in May. They'll probably increase by, you know, um, a thousand or two per category. That's what we've seen in the past. But that's what uh, a household looks like that, that we're talking about for affordable uh, housing. Uh, many of the people we serve, especially with our rental programs, are much, much lower than that, even lower than 30 percent. Um, so moving on, this is data that I took from the 2014 American Community Survey data. So certainly today all of these numbers are probably a, a little higher, I would assume. Um, but our population, uh, and these were using the five-year estimates, was 113, 155. Total housing units is 44,000. And it's about split half and half of owner, uh, slightly more renters. Um, for housing costs, the median rent was $804 per month. And the 2015 single family homes median sold price in Columbia was 176850 So if you think about what it was back in 2000, it was about 119000 uh, So we've seen quite a bit of appreciation in, in uh, housing median sold price. And that data is taken directly from the Board of Realtors webpage. So our household median income right now is about 43776 So more importantly, when we're talking about what are our affordable housing needs, uh, to link it back to our initial uh, definition, who expends 30% or more of the gross monthly income on housing costs? Owners fare, fare better in Columbia, but certainly, you know, owners, since they've moved into ownership, that makes sense. They, they probably have more financial capability to do that. About 22% of owners are what we call housing cost burden. Renters fare a lot less well, and this number went up uh, about a half a percent from what the, they were in 2013. 57% of renters, or about 12,000 uh, households, are what we call housing cost burdens. So that's really significant. That's a significant number to me that our renters are struggling with higher housing costs. So what do we do as a city? Just a brief overview. We have our homeownership assistance program, which I talked about earlier, where we provide up to 7,500 in down payment assistance. We do go up to 30 sometimes when we have funds available for our homes constructed. Uh, by Job Point, Habitat, or CMCA. We did 29 of these homes in 2015, uh, spent about 250000 which uh, resulted in about $2.9 in private mortgages for first-time home buyers. So this was our biggest year uh, since I've been here. Um, and 2016, we're on track to exceed that. So that's really good. 
We also do new construction that I talked about earlier that we require universal design in. Uh, we only do about 2, 2 to 4 homes per year. Uh, our demolition and acquisition program, we usually couple that with our construction program where we'll take down an older dilapidated home and replace it with a new energy efficient universally designed home. For rental new construction, we do typically one development per year. They're usually 42 to 100 unit developments. Uh, that are usually part of a larger funding package. So we'll typically provide between $100,000 and $200,000 a year in our home funds for one of these developments. Uh, but really, uh, it's coupled with low-income housing tax credit uh, financing. Uh, so these projects are usually eight, ten million or more. So some examples of that would be uh, the Lincoln and Unity uh, Housing Authority units that are being converted into project-based vouchers by the Housing Authority. We have some funds in that. Um, Oak Towers is another one, um, some of Jeff Smith's developments, Bethel Ridge uh, and Hanover Estates and Gentry Estates. But really what our funds do is it signals to MHDC or Missouri Housing Development Commission, who oversees the tax credits, that the city is supportive of the project. It does bring some financial assistance to the project and ensure we have a couple home funded units that are affordable. We have a rehab program where we provide up to 35,000 0% interest loans do up to 10 homes per year and then we have a minor home repair program where we go up to 10,000 in assistance. So all in all we, is, we typically assist about 50 to 65 households per year. So the households that we serve it's a great benefit especially to the to the households surrounding those houses so it has kind of a ripple effect on neighborhoods but certainly it's a drop in the bucket uh, when you look at what the need is. Um, you know what's not on here is what the housing authority does. The manager talked about them being the big player uh, which is uh, definitely the case. You think about how much money they spent, I think their housing choice voucher program, they expended about six million dollars last year. So if you look at the city's affordable housing funding, uh, the light blue is CDBG and the dark blue is home. Certainly as a whole we get more CDBG funding than home, uh, but we have a lot of different things that our CDBG funding goes towards. It goes towards our job training activities with, with JobPoint, uh, nonprofit community facility renovation, uh, like the Welcome Home Veterans Campus Project is one that we recently funded, uh, Reality House into action. Um, and then we also do some sidewalk projects and bus shelters. So there's a lot of different activities that CDBG funding uh, goes towards and a lot of their needs it serves, they're important. Uh, but if you had to look at just at what we do for affordable housing, it's certainly been declining uh, since 2007, which has been the trend for most uh, federally funded programs that, that go to assist those in need. So kind of sum it up uh, and link back to where I started with affirmatively furthering fair housing. Well, why is it important? The first reason uh, to me and my responsibilities is it's a legal requirement. So if we don't meet this with HUD or don't demonstrate that we're not affirmatively furthering fair housing, our funding can be at risk, so we could not qualify for CDBG or home funds, and that has happened in other parts of the country. Uh, it encourages communities to effectively plan for utilizing federally, federal funds, and I think it's really important that uh, we do effective planning on the front end to make sure those ever-decreasing federal dollars are spent on our priorities. Uh, it's also important because it allows us the opportunity to effectively examine and implement policies that may be preventing uh, furthering of fair housing. And then to sum it up, it improves communities and social equity, which is such an important topic for the city right now, through increased economic integration. So that's where I'm going to end today. I'll take any questions uh, about what the city does or any of its requirements. I think I heard you say that, that this uh, is kind of a drop in the bucket against overall Columbia needs. What else is going on for those overall Columbia needs to improve affordable housing? Sure. So uh, I mentioned the Housing Authority. Uh, you know, they have their public housing units and they're right now going through a process of uh, converting them into project based vouchers to the rental assistance demonstration program. Um, which uh, they're doing a great job and those are awesome projects. They also have their uh, housing choice voucher program uh, where they provide up to six million dollars in, in vouchers. Um, so I would say they're, they're probably the largest other player in affordable housing. Now there's other organizations 
that provide some housing assistance for those at risk of homelessness and have other special needs like uh, Phoenix programs, uh, helping persons with substance abuse uh, problems, Burrell Behavioral Health, uh, Lutheran Family Services, they all get some different smaller pots of money uh, called continue, continue of Care Funding. Uh, so we have some other voucher type uh, assistance in town, probably a significant amount of voucher type assistance for those that are at risk of homelessness. Uh, but as far as the as addressing affordable housing, you know, the, the housing authority is the big player with rental, providing both public housing and now project-based vouchers and uh, uh, non-project-based vouchers. And then the city with its home ownership assistance program and then beyond that, it's whomever applies for low-income housing tax credit funding each year. You know, and you could, there's years where we've gotten two tax credit funded projects, you know, that might equal 42 units per whoever applies. There's years where the Columbia City hasn't gotten any because those are allocated out by a different commission. So yeah, that's kind of kind of the players. Do you expect to ever catch up with the need? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, right now, I, I would say we have a, a need that's outpacing our resources. That's, that's all I would be able to answer right now. The, the answer to that question probably is no. But a few things strike me, and, and I think it may be important to, to talk about a little bit of it. One is uh, the affordability aspect as it relates to utilities, which is an important part of this uh, part of this. Uh, issue. Um, then there is uh, the, what the city is doing in terms of the social equity piece as it relates to s the three of those targeted areas in particular and the reallocation of, of some of those monies um, is also important. Care to comment on some of yeah, those issues? Yeah, that's a real good point, especially with the strategic plan because uh, you mentioned about other resources around town. Uh, this is kind of the first I've seen of the city putting forward some significant resources to do additional affordable housing. Um, we have the, our new strategic plan, the three strategic neighborhood areas. There's one in the central city area just west of downtown. There's one in the north uh, and then one in the kind of the east to northeast area. Uh, but the city uh, allocated 100,000 additional in home buyer assistance where we can go up to 10,000. Uh, with the goal that we would help uh, additional ownership opportunities in those three areas that are uh, have indicators that show higher areas of need. Um, also, the city set aside an additional 200000 to to do our first four community land trust homes uh, that we're working on now. So, um, yeah, was there another piece to your question? Oh, yeah. The, uh, with our new land trust homes, uh, they're going to be, we're, we're working for them to be uh, close to net zero, so including solar. Uh, but as I mentioned with our new housing construction all having universal design, uh, they all also go beyond code for energy efficiency. So we require additional information or insulation, uh, higher uh, grade of HVAC. Uh, so the homes that we build with our publicly funded dollars are more energy efficient than just a straight code built home. Um, with that, another cool thing we've been doing with all of our new construction is adding in radon mitigation because we find it to be very inexpensive while you're doing new construction to it. Um, much more expensive to go back and retrofit. Uh, and we do some radon mitigation through our rehab program. Um, so each new home that's uh, built with our HUD funds will have a passive radon venting uh, installed near electric panels. Uh, so it's just a, basically like a plastic bucket in the ground and a PVC pipe that will go through the top of the roof and then they do testing at the end. If it fails the test, we add a fan. If we don't, we just leave it as is. So if there's an issue down the road, they can add a fan. Um, what's interesting with radon is we've been testing all of our rehab uh, customers and I think this is another issue that people should, we as a community should probably look into a little more closely. Um, you know, a lot of folks think, oh, radon's not an issue around here. Uh, but we've been doing testing, and it seems like about uh, close to 25% of the ones that we test actually do have a, an issue, um, and then we've been installing mitigation. So you never know until you test. <laughs> For any of you here that want to know what you could do to help this, 
if you have a relationship or know a builder or develop, developer, uh, try and convince them to start building un with universal design so people can actually age in place in their homes that way they don't have to keep changing houses because they get older and their ability status changes and to build more moderately affordable housing so if you any of you can do that that would certainly help the cause can you tell from the data whether the city is becoming less desegregated uh yeah um i was looking at that earlier um so when, more integrated, yeah. So uh, I have a couple other slides I didn't include, but when we did our analysis to impediments to fair housing, uh, we looked at what are the migration patterns of different minorities, and one in particular, if you look at African American populations, uh, this shows the change by census block uh, in African American population. The uh, green to dark green, the greener it gets shows where more African Americans are moving. Uh, as you move from the yellow to the red, that shows where it's decreasing. And this map shows uh, the, the many African Americans are, uh, well, or, or that snapshot in time. There's more African Americans on the periphery, or periphery in 2010 than there is in the central city. It kind of shows a migration outward, particularly to the north and to the northeast. Um, and I remember looking back, I looked at just the two maps together instead of showing the change. I looked at 1990 and 2010. If you look down in southwest Columbia, that was all very, very dark red there. You know, mainly, uh, particularly white was, was that area. Um, and if you looked at 2010, it was, it was less like that. It was less like that. But I think there still is a lot of work to be done. I think there's been some movement, but I think there's still definite areas of, of concentration on minorities, uh, particularly poverty uh, uh, concentration minorities. Um, does that answer your question? So I'd say we've had some, but there needs to be much more. Any other questions? Thank you, Randy. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for coming, um, and I'd appreciate if you could fill out the survey and turn it in at the back of the room or at the registration table. Let's once again thank our speakers, Eric, Randy, Jillian, Kelly, um, Rigel. I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. Um, and I would also like to thank the Missouri Commission on Human Rights for sponsoring breakfast, the Columbia Apartment Associations for providing refreshments and snacks, and the Columbia Housing Authority for helping us promote this and get the word out and to plan for it. Thank you all for coming. Have a great day.